Hi, this is Dan and Lexi from Dan Schultz Outdoors, reminding you to keep the adventures alive. Hey y'all, I'm Johnny. And I'm Colleen. And, and we're, we're the Keel Quest. Quest. And, and we, we want, want you to keep, keep the, the adventures alive. alive. Cheers. Cheers. Hey, this is Darren from My Paddle Repeat, encouraging you to keep the adventures alive. This is David from Beachley Ironworks saying keep the adventures alive. Hi, I'm Kevin Collin, the Happy Camper. Remember, keep the adventures alive. Awesome! Woo, buddy! Shug here! Keep the adventures alive. I am. Ethan here, the Avid Outdoorsy Guy, reminding you to keep the adventures alive. We're John and Aaron. Keep the adventures alive. It's Kylan from Lure of the North, and I encourage you to keep the adventures alive. This is Sky North telling you, keep the adventures alive. And now on with the show. another edition of canoe hounds outdoor adventure show a show that brings you a lot closer to the great outdoors by bringing you hot topics related by and watch my name is dennis also known as canoe hound and if you're new to the show thanks very much for tuning in for your first time and uh you know what hopefully you'll join us here every tuesday evening at 7 p.m which is our regular night and our regular time uh if you haven't already done so, consider subscribing because uh, we do have lots of great content that we bring you every single week, and uh, tonight's going to be no exception. Uh, just want to get started tonight uh, with a few announcements while the chat over there populates and uh, some of our regular viewers pop in, um, and then we'll get into uh, tonight's topic. Uh, Firstly, to anybody that might be tuned in right now from Facebook, uh, Facebook is something new that we're doing uh, in addition to our, our YouTube live feed. They're both the same feed, obviously. Uh, I'm just kind of curious as to how it's looking on the, on, on the end of, uh, on the Facebook end there. And I was hoping that uh, anybody that might be watching, if you could drop me an email after the show at canoehound at gmail.com, just let me know how it looks on your end, if everything's okay. Uh aside from like quality issues with internet and stuff like that. I just like to know how it looks on the Facebook end, just so that uh, I can make any improvements if, uh, if need be. Uh, let's see here. Last week's show. I'm going to leave that email address down there for a bit because we're going to use it a lot tonight. Uh, last week's show was a real eye opener for many. Uh, the topic was uh, troubles in the back country. And we heard many different accounts of uh, from viewers like yourself about uh, situations or mishaps that happened in the back country and how, how they got themselves out of it. Uh, we heard stories of, you know, some bad weather. We heard uh, stories about a spruce trap. If anybody's curious about that, you can look that up. 
uh, lightning strikes, frostbite, and frostbite, and probably one of the most uh, most scary. Well, you know what? They're all scary in their own right. But it was uh, uh, Rob Howe actually had uh, had a story, or he was telling us of his account when he had a heart attack uh, on a portage trail up uh, north of Opiongo Lake in Algonquin Park. You know what? It's a real eye opener, and uh, it, it's a show that uh, if you did happen to miss it last week, uh, it's it's lot or it's ready for replay in the uh, in the playlist there for season two. And it's called Troubles in the Back Country. Make sure you check it out. It's a very good uh, episode, and you know what? You never know. You might take something away from it that can you know either prevent something from happening serious or something that may save your life in the back country. So by all means, if you have the opportunity, please do check that out. Just, uh, just because, and another question I have too, about that show, uh, that was one of the first shows that I, I have done where it was really, uh, all, all about the participation of viewers, people like you, uh, we had many, many people on, I put out a casting call and I'm just curious as to know as to, did you like that type of format? Um, you know, what can we have improved on on that? I'm all about improving the show, making it a better product for you to 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 view and to watch. If if you have any suggestions, there again, there's an email right down here. Please drop me an email at canoehound at gmail.com and let me know what you think of that format. Should we actually try that a few more times? Because uh, I have a bunch of topics that we can utilize and uh, bring awareness to everybody by doing that type of a formatted show. And I really do enjoy having you up here on panel with us and sharing your stories and experiences because you know what, that's what this whole community is about is everybody sharing, getting to learn and uh, to, to know new techniques and things of that sort from everybody else. Everybody has their own way of doing things and it's so nice to learn and share it. And that's what this is. It's, it's like a teaching opportunity or a communication opportunity. So uh, give me any suggestions right down here at canoehound at gmail.com. You can do that at any time. Uh, I answer all my emails, so uh, you, you will get a reply from me either way uh, when you do send something. Uh, congratulations based on last week's show as well to uh, the swag winners. Andrew Scott and Greg Reimer both won a Canoe Hound Adventures prize pack and a little bit of swag from uh, – Algonquin Outfitters. So congratulations to you two for, uh, we did two giveaways last week and tonight we're going to be doing two giveaways as well. Thanks to, uh, the generosity of an anonymous contributor, um, who actually, uh, is, has, has provided for tonight's giveaway. So thank you very much for your support. You know who you are. And, uh, he asked that I don't mention his name. So, uh, or her name. So, uh, We'll just leave it at that. So, but let it be known that I'm uh, very appreciative of uh, what you're what you what you've done here. So, thank you very much. So, two swag giveaway prizes tonight. So, pay attention, everybody. Uh, you'll have, everybody will have that chance to win. I uh, just wanted to send out a huge uh, shout out to uh, all my channel members. Uh, plus, I'd like to welcome uh, two new channel members that uh, we just uh, brought on: Smoking Our Barbecue. And somebody tonight who you can see way up here in the chat, and I'm going to put his name up here just to show that I am appreciative of it, and that would be uh, Joseph uh, Vrankovic. So, Joseph, what I need you to do is I need you to drop me an email uh, with your mailing address so I can get your uh, your channel membership sticker out to you, okay? So if you can uh, drop me an email with your information there to canoehound at gmail.com and I'll get that in the mail to you. Thanks very much for your support. And of course, always our solo paddle members, uh, Stein North, Kevin with an A and Jeremy Wall. Thanks you guys for uh, your support. It's greatly appreciated. And for anybody who might be interested, there's a little join button right around down here. And uh, if you want, if you want information on becoming a Canoe Hunt Adventures uh, channel member, it's a way of supporting the channel and getting additional perks. Uh, you know, just a bunch of little things and some some really cool stuff uh, at the highest level. After three months, you actually get a free Canoe Hunt Adventures T-shirt. So that's uh, that's just the type of perks that come along with it. Uh, if you're interested, hit that join button, get more information. But I just want to say that all members that we have by the end of March will be going into a draw. And I've got a uh, swag giveaway for channel members only. Uh, one lucky winner will walk away with a swag package. It's probably, and it's still growing. It's probably right now at about $150. And I'm expecting it's going to be about a $300 to $350 value by the time all is said and done. So if you want a chance, you have to be a channel supporter for that. Uh, like I say, all the information is down there. Uh, I also like to thank uh, my business uh, supporters. 
pay attention to this because this here might come into play later on in the show. Wink, 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 nudge, nudge, right? Uh, like to thank our business partners, uh, new Ursac USA. Thanks very much for your support. Uh, Backcountry Coffee Company, once again, enjoying a nice uh, roast of their Aurora Roast. Uh, let's see here. Kid Products, makers of the Kid Twig Stove and the new Reflector Oven. Algonquin Outfitters, great signs and graphics, and the Short Hill Beard Company. Thanks, you guys, all for your support. Great, greatly appreciated. A uh, couple more little things here. I know Babylon, Babylon, but I'm really waiting until we get all the people in the chat over there. It's a great opportunity. Uh, we still do have our patches for sale, our uh, Canoe Island Adventures iron-on patches. They're $6 each or two for 10. If you get uh, two for 10, I'll also throw in a decal pack and free shipping mailed to either Canada or the U.S. Emails right there. Just let me know if you're interested. And... Next week on our show, we have, uh, we'll be joined by C.W. Getz from the podcast, radio show, and video program, The Camping Show. Uh, we're going to introduce you to uh, something else that you might enjoy uh, beyond Canoe Hound Adventures. Uh, it's a great show. I love watching it myself, and I believe our one of our guests, or our guest tonight, Kevin Callen, was actually on, uh, on a show uh, along with, um, oh, what's his name? Never mind. I'm a brain fart. But anyways, Kevin was on a show there uh, a couple weeks back, and it was a really good show, and it's a really fun watch. So uh, you might want to tune in for that next week. Also, if you have any hot topics or guests you'd like to see on the show, once again, use that email address. Uh, send me your suggestions. I've had a bunch coming in, and I've got a few lined up for the next few weeks, so we're, we're looking good there. And last but not least, and I say it every week, it's an interactive show. If anybody has any questions, put them in the chat over here. The word question in capital letters before your question so it makes it easier for me to see. No guarantee I will get it on, but if I don't, I'm going to invite every, well, I'm going to invite whoever wants to come up on panel later to ask questions because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions about tonight's topic on planning a backcountry canoeing or camping trip for the spring. Um, so there you go. You know, the cat's out of the bag about what tonight's show is all about. And uh, without further ado, we will get right into that. Uh, I see in the green room here, my uh, my guest must have, oh, he's sneaking back into frame now. There we go. Uh, da -da -da. Yeah, yeah. anyway, so tonight's topic of discussion, planning a backcountry spring canoe or uh, backpacking trip. And uh, we're going to be helped along with our conversation here with our good friend, Mr. Kevin Callen. How are you doing, Kevin? I'm on already. I just put tea on. Yo, that's okay. If you need to go get your tea, uh, no pressure. You can do that. No, I'm good. I'm good. You're good. You're good. Oh, I, I, you know, I'm I'm 100 with you, Dennis. <laughs> you I'm always are, man. Thanks. I, I, I'm you're, you're, a good, you're a good uh, shoulder to lean on. That's for sure. Yes, I'm Apostle number 14. Apostle number 14. There you go. If we, if we had the good or the great Last Supper going up here, we'd be all right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Kevin, uh, talked to you earlier there, and. Uh, of course, we're gonna we're gonna let people know what we know about planning spring canoe and camping trips or uh, backpacking trips, and they are they are a little bit different than planning you know your typical summer or fall trip. Uh, what would you say you know how how does a spring trip differ from what you would experience in the summer or the fall? Well, in the weather, because you might die, right? Let's hope not. Yeah, because <laughs> really in the spring you've got really hot weather. Really buggy weather, really windy weather, really cold weather, like snow, sleet. So you got to pack for everything. And mm -hmm. uh, the thing about the spring too is you're so excited to get out. You're like, I'm free, I'm free. And and then you're like, oh, this is not this is not a happy place right now. Like yeah, you, you, know, you kind of sort of you got to pack everything. And then you're also out of shape. I don't know about you guys, but like I I try to get out a lot in the wintertime, but. <laughs> My lord, the first trip in the spring on the very first portage, I'm like, yeah, I'm old. I'm old. It hurts. So yeah. you got to work on that. Um, it's just the excitement of it all, but you really have to watch it. Yeah. I guess, I guess one of the, bit, the big factors is, like you say, the weather, right? Uh, spring can be so unpredictable. You know, you could end up with a, a bunch of really warm, sunny days in a row, or you can get a, a like a Mother Nature's mood swing, eh, going from, uh, you know, being the frigid woman she could be right up to a uh, woman with hot flashes, right? So it's <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not no, you know what I mean though? The, the weather, the weather changes can, uh, can hit really quick. Um, you know, things can really catch you off guard. You can have 
toasty warm weather one day and the next day uh, you're experiencing snowfall that's actually sticking to the ground. Oh yeah. I, I remember one um, Mother's Day uh, weekend, we were in Algonquin Park, uh, Speedoman and I and a couple other people and major snowstorm. And we couldn't leave the campsite. We had to stay there for uh, an extra night and we didn't see that coming. And of course my mother goes, well, if you visited me instead, you would have been fine. Yeah, so. <laughs> you got to visit your mother a little more often, Kevin. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. You know, like uh, my, my last uh, ice out trip, and I'm going to get into a bit about like what happened to us last year, because everybody knows what happened about this time last year when the uh, crap started hitting the fan. But the year before that, when I did my, my ice out trip, and it was quite literally, uh, that was two years ago when Algonquin Park was actually, they, they suspended the opening of the park twice. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like they suspended it by like two weeks, and then they, I think, extended it by another week at another point. And I just did a quick little uh, four four day trip up to um, oh gosh Smoke Lake. Uh, I ended up at Bonnechere Lake, anyways. And I remember when we got there, my my dog. As soon as we got to the the launch at Smoke Lake, my dog right in the water, right. And I went and I put my hand in the water. It was ice, like it the, the ice had just finish coming off the lake like as a matter of fact we we passed like i paddled past a couple plates of ice still floating around on the lake right and it's always a worry that like you know for for the canoeing aspect of planning a spring trip is making sure that uh you know one you don't dunk but what do you do if you do because the water is so frigid right yeah you really really gotta watch it and also have to watch out for other people so if you're skilled enough to know that uh have an eye out for other people because um it really does get us like we want, especially I think this spring, because and I, I'm pretty sure we're going to be allowed to go out. Just remember last year? I mean, it wasn't until June, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, people are going to go out and they're going to go out by the hundreds. And just keep an eye on everybody because we're all we're young at one time. We all were inexperienced and and sort of like, I'm free again. Right. And so yeah. just make sure if they, someone's flips, you know how to do a canoe over canoe rescue and keep everybody calm. And uh, yeah, it's it's always a, every year I get this call for CBC Radio. Oh, so someone you know drowned. You want to talk about that? I went no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, I would like to talk about it, but I don't want to emphasize the point that what they're doing because I wasn't there when that happened. Well, what what would you do as an expert? I go well, I wasn't there when it happened, so I don't know. But it, it will happen again this year. So yeah, uh, everybody, we have to watch out for everybody else. Yeah. And another factor too with the, with the water or like water levels, you know, uh, something in the springtime that uh, is really high in the fall time can be really, really low where there's no water or, you know, late in the summer. So your, your water levels could be much higher and therefore uh, any, any moving water could be that much more dangerous, right? Oh, for sure. Like I, I, I want to take uh, Christine, my partner down the French river uh, this year. But not until like the end of July. And I showed her a video on YouTube, these guys going down the French River, uh, the upper French, um, in early spring. And she's like, oh, I'm not doing that. I went, no, it's, it's good. We're not going to go when the water is going to be like that. Uh, so it's, it's all about planning, uh, when to go, who to go with. And also, if you go with someone that's brand new, you know, you know, not not guys, but they'll always say, "No, I, I know what I'm doing." Well, if you don't really know that person, make sure they do know what they're doing, uh, mm -hmm. and, and also make sure when you go out on any spring trip with with anybody new, have a set plan of what you want to get out of the trip, right? I mean, I've gone on trips before with a bunch of uh, fishing guys, my buddies. We all go trout fishing in the spring, and one guy brought a buddy from work, and oh, you know, he's good, he's good. And the first hour, he's like, why are you guys fishing? I don't like fishing. I was like, <laughs> like and that's fine if he doesn't like fishing. But we're on a seven-day spring trip in Algonquin, and that's all we want to do is fish. And he was like, you guys are really boring. Like, can, can we keep going? Like, what's going on? Yeah. So you got to really plan for that. Who he you going missed with? the memo, did he? Oh, no, yeah, I, I don't know what that what I said. So who are you going with, when you're going what you're packing and in the springtime you got to bring every single piece of gear possible to keep warm hydrated bug free you're, you're going to pack a lot of stuff you're, you're going to hurt on the portage because you're out of shape why do we even do this dennis really i know right i know right <laughs> so, so you you mentioned what happened last year 
going to set up the scenario that everybody already knows. Um, and we'll, we'll start with the beginning of the story, okay? Wife and I, we just get back from a nice warm holiday. Uh, a buddy of mine or, and myself are getting ready. We're getting prepared. And you know well, well enough yourself, get ready to go to Canoe Copia, right? What's that, first week of March or so? Yeah. Right? yeah. And everybody's got their eye on, you know, the, the, the website for that particular show waiting to see if it's going to be canceled due to the, the pandemic, right? And sure enough, it happens. It's canceled. And then everything goes for a nosedive for everybody that's been planning or, or w- wanting to plan. And it is now magnified, right? It, it's now multiplied the, 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 the want. All of a sudden, everybody's thinking, I'm not going to be able to go on my canoe trip or my hiking trip or they're going to close the parks. And at that point, they hadn't closed them yet. Because instead of going to Canoe Copia, my buddy and I decided, well, we're going to go to Mew Lake. And we did uh, three or four days there. And everything was closed up except for Mew Lake, right? Like the visitor center was closed. And uh, they even had the, uh, uh, like all, all the all the places of interest were all closed off except for the park. Then the day after we left, they closed Mew Lake. And that, that's when the government made the announcement, okay, all, all parks are, are – and the backcountry is closed, right? And everybody goes into a panic. So now everybody's thinking right away, oh, no, my spring trip, okay, including myself. I had a spring trip planned with uh, a couple guys that are in the chat tonight there, uh, Avid Outdoorsy guy and Dan Schultz. We had reservations made. We, like, you know, we we're doing our weekly Zoom calls to, to make sure that, like, you know, what we're going to do and yada, yada. And this is, like, a couple months before we're ready to go. And then everything got pulled out from underneath us. And then they closed the borders, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. It, it now, was because, because really, um, I don't know about everybody out there, but to me, like, the, the spring trip to me, I, I, like, I know I'm religious, but but the whole spring canoe trip to me is more religious than than religion because <laughs> 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 around this time of year in fact actually uh andy and i with mass on uh, the other day we're having a map and flap here right and we got the scotch going got the maps going um uh, ashley speedman was like when we go on uh in a, in a gonquin can we go to a gonquin where are we going and the excitement anticipation and remember last year it was like sort of like honestly honestly it was a gut punch and then a then a smack to the lip down to the ground it's like Really? Yeah. Really? And then we all, you know, okay, we get it. So we had to keep mentally fit and by doing other things. And then we're allowed to go out in June. And I got to say, I and it, it's going to be worse this year. Well, I, I have a belief it will be worse this year. But when I finally went out that week, it was, there were so many people, like hundreds more people. I went, what's going on? Yeah. And then they realize these other people that never really did tripping before realize that actually wilderness is our savior, right? It's basically will will reconnect us and have a that, that's our solace. And then we're like, that's great, but I don't want you here right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this year, um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be that more than twofold. Um, so yeah, it's going to be different. I, I don't know about you, and I, well, I, I know the situation you're in because you're really self self isolated due to the the uh, uh, your your job and stuff like that, right? But I, I think I got in more canoeing last year than I've ever gotten in in a full summer season and fall. Well, that's good. I mean, I, I, I June, yeah, I looked at my journal uh, the other night, and I actually got out more than I thought last year. Uh, I had a bad back issue, which is a real pain. It had nothing to do with the the the, the pandemic. Um, but uh, but I did get out there, and I was actually in the tent over I think sixty two nights, so it was pretty good um and and this year hopefully more but it's the spring trip and and and, but the thing is we all get excited and then you're on that trip and the bugs are really bad and the weather's really bad and you're like what (laughs) (laughs) and that's something else we'll get into actually the bugs too i just want to put a comment here uh was that the right one oh yeah mom's uh men's tribe I was most bummed. I had my 13 year old talked into a hike last year. Now, now it's, uh, she's lost or she has zero interest. Right. And that, that, that could have happened to a lot of people. Get her back out there, get her, get her interested in it, in it again. All you got to do is get her out there and chances are she's going to be uh, right back into it and get her before she's 16 years old. Right, Kevin? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yes. I, I take my daughter out for a walk every Sunday and, and, and now she goes, can we just go for a drive? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it happens. Um, uh, if you get that 13 year old out, uh, they might sort of fight tooth and nail the first or second day after that. And they'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. So my, my, my point there, I, I, I didn't want to talk about the whole C word, right? That the C O V word, right? COVID. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't want to talk about that. That, that wasn't my point of that. My point was, was that everybody that is into, or like, you know, has, been tripping for many years or whatever, didn't get that opportunity to get their spring trips in last year. Okay. So there could be a little bit of a uh, forgotten skill or technique and stuff like that, which brings us to tonight's show, trying to talk about and enlighten people as to, you know, the differences and what you need to do to plan these trips. So here we are in February. Um, things are icy. I know it's been a little warmer down here in Niagara today, and it's going to be for the next couple of days, but we, nobody knows when ice is actually going to be out, right? So when it comes to planning an ice out trip, how should you go about planning that, Kevin? Uh, nobody knows for sure when. Do you just pick a date in the spring and hope it's close to the ice out? Yeah, it's a tough one. So go back in time, too, before the pandemic. Um, ice out, ice not. And because of global warming, or whether you believe that or not, but but it, it, something weird is happening. Uh, we have springs where it's uh, the Algonquin is frozen over where it never was or um, it's in flood or whatever. And I remember two years ago, uh, we, had, we had booked, we, we generally, my buddies and I do our spring trip the Mother's Day weekend, and then we do a five day on the third week. So it's either before the long weekend or after the long weekend. So we generally don't go to a on a long weekend because there's like crazy people. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but you know, two years ago, it was still frozen and Ontario Park said, well, you're not allowed here. And a lot of people got upset. So well, I'm going, whether you like it or not, I'm thinking, well, they're doing it because they don't want you to die. Right. Uh, and it's, the lake is frozen. So you, you can't go canoeing. Um, so I remember telling my buddy, said, Hey, I got another plan. I, I we're going to go to uh, Halliburton um, wildland trails or no waterway trails. Waterway trails. Yeah. yeah and we, I, we went, went off and in, uh, into uh, new Nikani, um, some other small lakes I know in the, in the back there with some brook trout Lake. And they're like, gee, Kevin, will we catch fish? I went, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, and here's the thing about trip planning that you guys will laugh at. I hate planning my buddies trips because I, I plan trips for my students or when I used to guide, whatever. And when I go out with my buddies, I don't want to work. And so, but of course, but being, being a trip planner too, if things go wrong, it's all my fault, mm -hmm. right? We yeah. didn't get fish, Kevin. What, what's wrong with you? Or if we did a really good trip and we caught lots of fish, nobody really even says, way to go, Kevin. Like, it's like it, the whole trip planning is just bizarre. So, but I guess what I'm getting on, I'm rounding on, on, on a lot tonight. I'm going to go pandemic today. Um, but you need a trip planner. You need a lead. You need a leader. And it's tough to say that, but you need one specific person to control the entire group and mm -hmm. give out um, jobs and just, you know, that sort of thing. So when we did that trip, you know, it was, oh, it was terrible weather. It was raining, snowing. The birds hadn't come up yet. Uh, we weren't sure if the fish were, were going to bite. But yet we, here we are and we caught fish and we had a great time and went to somewhere we never, ever thought of going before. So that was a good thing about it. Like it was like, oh, and now, and I'm, oh, hey, we should go back to Halliburton. It was really good, Kevin. Um, that sort of thing. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sorry, I'm blabbing. No, 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 no. By all means, you know, it's funny that that you like what we're talking about here. Um, I'm trying uh, trying to think of instances, and one one that comes to mind are uh, John and Aaron from uh, Lost Lakes, formerly uh, Backcountry Angling Ontario. I know they changed their name like diapers. <laughs> <laughs> no. they, they they did a trip uh, a couple of years ago uh or like la maybe last winter or, or whenever and it was the show where where aaron was actually like up to her hips in ice water breaking ice because they thought they would have got back into the lake and it would have been thawed out but it wasn't and the whole light like like 95 or 80 percent of the lake was over frozen over so it was uh it was quite the thing and that that could just show you how not planning your trip properly or, or picking the right dates can really throw a screwball into uh into what you're doing, right? Yeah, so. yeah. Well, I, but also there, there, I think a lot of people are questioning, like, well, how do I know if the ice is out uh, up in Tomogamy? Because I live in Toronto. 
Mm -hmm. um, well, there's a lot of websites now. I mean, back in the, the old days, oh God, I'm not that old, but but we had to phone someone and say to the m and and say, hey, is the ice out? But there's yeah. also um, websites uh, that I can link to you guys that show uh, water levels. Um, uh, every river that's dammed has a water level um, site and shows you what the level is. So you oh, don't have to guess that. Um, it's really easy to find. So you, Because you, even like the local river here, because uh, it's dam controlled, it could be a drought, but they could open the dam one day and it's flooded, right? So so you can look into that. Um, I know Algonquin Outfitters will even have a cam shown you, or, or, or actually a friends of Algonquin will have a camera sh shown Obi Uncle Lake saying this, the ice is out, the ice is not. So mm -hmm. we're lucky now nowadays for that. But just um, don't get too excited. Uh, keep a plan, that's for sure, but, but always have a backup plan and have another backup plan. So this is where we're going. This is how many days. This is when, you know, the date's set. And then if that doesn't work, have a backup plan. And it's not that easy now with, with parks because they're so booked right now. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but try to book a campsite right now in a campground. Mm -hmm. Jeez. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, but uh, know some crown land areas. And when you do find them, don't tell anybody. Like, take it to your grave. Yeah. Um, but have some backup plans just in case things fall apart. There again, uh, you know, when you when you weigh that out, Crown Land versus provincial parks, right? Uh, first off, the provincial parks will not take reservations until they know their park is going to open, anyways. Is that correct? Uh, oh, someone help me here. I well, I know yeah. the, they're they're booking campsites right now, but for the interior, someone help yeah, me. Yeah, but, but for when they expect that the park's going to open, like they won't they won't book back uh, backcountry campsites or like you know routes unless. They know the, when the park. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not sure. I, this is an education for me too, right? Yeah. If anybody knows, put it in the in the chat over there. That'd be quite interesting to know. Yeah, they will. There's very intelligent people here tonight. I swear. Yeah. It's because I know. I know Ontario Parks last year. Was it last year that they changed the whole? Like you know, you had to re-register again if you're already registered and stuff because they changed all their systems, right? Yeah. Well, COVID changed a lot of things, and it changed a lot for this year as well. And some people are taking advantage of that system, and some people aren't, and some people are getting angry with that system. And I think it's going to be really interesting right now how pallers and campers um, deal with Ontario Parks this year. Uh, it, it's not. <laughs> It's not going over well right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got uh, Nate Muskoka saying, I can tell you right now, as far as the Algonquin Muskoka watershed goes for the spring, the word right now on everyone's minds is floods, right? Which which there again causes its own problems, right? High water, um, you know. Yeah. 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 And, and, and yeah, because they got a lot of snow, actually. And today, actually, where I live, we got a lot of snow that started melting today, and the, the whole municipality was here trying to fix the roads. So it's going to happen. Yeah. But we're going to get out whether we you know you like it or not, Dennis. I swear, yeah. if I don't catch a brook trout this spring, I'm going to lose it. You know what? Don't, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. I, I have never caught a brook trout in my life. <laughs> I know. I know. Okay. Call me what you want. I've never caught a lake or uh, a brook trout in my life. Well, I'm I, I've never had opportunity to really fish for them in, in the spring and stuff like that because really? of the areas that I go to normally, right? So, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say right now that you're not a real man, Dennis. Well, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> <I've eaten brook trout. laughs> I never actually caught one, right? My buddy's always bragging to me about that. He's got a couple secret lakes in Algonquin Park he goes to, and he catches like the brookies like this right it's like yeah okay i still haven't gone there with them so I, it is what it is. i'm just joking i got a really sorry I, I i i am going pandemic here but um uh brook trout to me why i love brook trout fishing is that they're not easy to catch you really know you have to know their habitat their environment their what they're feeding on the time of of year the temperature of the water it's not catching a bass or a pike Right. And that's why I love uh, brook trout fishing so much. I mean, I have gone down the Nipissing River in Algonquin Park, got out of the canoe and waded down the river with just my boxers on uh, and felt the cold water coming out from the internal streams coming into the Nipissing, marked it on my GPS and then caught brook trout right there because during the summer, that's where they'll hold up. And there's no way I'm going to tell anybody where those spots were because it took me like five to seven years to find those spots. But that's why brook trout fishing is just an, it, it's just incredible because of that work that you had to do to get it, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. 
That's crazy. Or, or you just get lime and throw it in the water and they'll die and they'll come up to the surface and just, or, or explosive. You'll, put dynamite in, you'll catch them, no problem. <laughs> You're going to open a whole new can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do that, people. Don't do that. <laughs> that's illegal. <laughs> it's illegal. Yeah, that stopped everybody, right? Uh, a couple of questions here will we'll pop up here while we're trudging along here. Uh, Matthew uh, Ligostino is asking, what are your thoughts on the Unlostify trip planning side of their map? Uh, do you use it or something similar? Um, I got to be honest. I, lo I love the, the maps. I love their old maps uh, and all the, you know, it all happened, uh, whatever happened. Um, I never used the back end of that map. Um, I'd be honest. Uh, I, I like his maps, but I don't use the trip planning part of it. I use my own. Uh, so I, I, I'll, my whole upstairs is full of topo maps and also other old maps with my own writings and my own drill entries and little squash mosquitoes beside it. Um, that's what I love. Uh, that's not, that's my trip planning. But I, I, mean, I wrote guidebooks for years, right? So that's how we did it. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't. I know that's a good question. You should ask everybody else if they use it because I because I don't. Does anybody else in the chat use that uh, to help plan their trips? Uh, OG in a canoe is asking here a question, but more of a statement. We usually start pre-planning our ice out trip last trip on Thanksgiving weekend, right? So uh, you yeah. know what? A lot of people do that. I know uh, last year's trip that I was supposed to do with Avid Outdoorsy guy and Dan Schultz, we uh, we we talked about that like you know before the previous season was done, right? And uh, like you know, it was all in the air saying, "Yeah, we got to do this, we got to do this." And before you knew it, it took foothold and the ball started rolling. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, OJ, I watched your uh, your uh, latest. Uh... A Gunkin trip the other day too that was really good. Someone's asked me here too about topo maps. Do I still use federal topo maps? Yes, I do. Uh, I, I ordered them through Ottawa. Um, what's the map store in Ottawa? I ordered them, but also I work part time at the college, so I can actually photocopy all the maps that exist. Right, so that's a big thing, um, and that's what I use. Or I use you know you know the whatever map is, is available for Gunkin or Clarny or Tomogamy, but I always bring topos and. That's not my age. Um, they are out of date in one sense because those maps were produced by back in the day where a plane flew over, took photos, aerial photographs, and then a map was created from that. So then every 10 years they would upgrade it and then they're still doing that. So they, they are out of date. Uh, but um, at the same time, I now uh, just started this year, I, I bring a GPS with a, a map system in the GPS or on my phone if, if my uh, you know, if I bring my phone. So, yeah, but the biggest thing is uh, I have all that information, but I also know, and this is a lost thing that we have, or trip planning, you really need to listen to this. You, you really need a skill, it's called bush time, to look out at Obiango or Georgian Bay or Lake Nivicon and see the islands in front of you, look at the map and know where those islands are. Nobody can do that anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and and it's not an old fashioned, hey, I, you know, here I am with my walker. Oh, you know what I did? It. It's not to do that. It's, it, it's bush time, looking at a map and looking at the landscape and knowing where you are by looking at those two things. Really yeah. practice on that one. I'm, I'm a map guy myself. Uh, I, I go to a site uh, online. I think, I believe it's called topomaps.com or something like that. It's yeah. Topo. Yep. And, you go on there, and if you can if you can navigate through their system, and you can actually find the district, you can get all the topo maps for that area. I download them on my computer, throw them in Photoshop, and then I crop sections like puzzle pieces of the trip, and that's what I utilize for uh, for my canoe trips. If I if I could uh, find a link to that after the show, I'll drop the uh, link in the description below. So if anybody wants to. Check out that resource; it'll be available to them as well, and it's free. Yeah. Just look up, look up Toporama, you, and you'll find it. Yeah, actually, that's what it is, Toporama. Yeah, and uh, it's a great site. And someone yeah. else was asking about declination. Yes, you do. Uh, the, the the declination written on your old maps w were for that year, and declination changes every year. Not so much, but it, uh, a lot. But it does change, and it will get you lost. So. Um, there is a mathematical for a thing I can show you. It takes us an hour. Um, it, it baffles my students. Just Google it. <laughs> Just say, mm -hmm. I'm going to go to Pembroke. What is the declination in Pembroke? And it will show you. So you don't have to do that. Uh, but yeah, the old maps, when it shows you the declination, if that map was created in 1978, it is not the same declination that it was in 1978. Right. 
Makes sense. Uh, back to what we were ta talking about, the reservations with Algonquin. Uh, Dan Schultz is saying Algonquin moved back to their first reservable day to make sure ice was out. Uh, they got tired of canceling and changing reservations, changing, changed that a couple of years ago. Yeah. Oh, okay. So good to know. So, to know. so Dan, what, 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 so Algonquin moved back to their first reservable day to make sure that you know, tired of canceling changes. Oh, but what does that mean, Dennis? Well, I'd imagine that uh, they they set when they're going to open the park, right? And uh, oh, and then they open it up. To yeah, them. then they'll open it up based on on that day. And if the ice happens to be out earlier, who knows? Maybe they'll open it up earlier. I don't know. But that year, two years ago, was a rather unique year, wasn't that? The year that like all the Great Lakes froze over and everything. Like everything was like we went in. We had the polar vortex, deep frost, yeah. freeze. Yeah. Yeah, that's when the wolves came over uh, across Lake Superior onto uh, Isle Royale and then uh, started killing all the moose. Is and uh, they said they were, all, they were all in a panic because the moose were dying off. And then they're like, well, what should we do? And they said, well, don't shoot the wolves. It's a cycle. Like the, the wolves will kill some of the moose because the moose are overpopulated. It's a cyclical thing. And that was the, the, the new – I mean, now we think that's normal. But back in the day, they were like, oh, no, we got to kill them. Kill them. Shoot them all. So, yeah. um, uh, so sorry, uh, we will, we'll, oh gosh, oh, someone just had a good question and I lost it. It was at this one here. Do you offer classes on maps online? Oh no, uh, but no. no, I, but I do. I actually, um, I just created one. Maybe I should send that out. Um, cause I'm still teaching online. Uh, the school system asked me to teach uh, GPS and compassing online when I'm thinking, oh my God, that's impossible. And it took me months, but I figured out how to do it. So uh, mm. yeah, so so send me an email, and I'll, I'll I can send something to you. Well, you you have a couple of videos on your channel regarding that too, right? Yeah, compass work and stuff like that. Yeah. It's a lot easier though. If I was in the woods with you and we had a map and compass in two hours, everything be fine. Uh, it's just a lot harder on, on, online, but that's the way it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, well, I'm looking forward to when we get together because I could use a, a little bit of uh, brushing up on my my compass skills. I'm good at reading a map, but my compass skills could be a little shoddy at times. So well, you, I don't use it. I don't use a compass very often, right? So. Well, but here's the thing, though. And it's a really good point to make. You need to upgrade it every year, just like your first aid, because you will never need it. But when you need it, you're like, oh, I forgot this. So, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm just uh, reaching for a book that I have here. Where the heck is it? There, there it is. Sorry. But just a, a basic or map and compass illustration guide, right? Well, that's Cliff's book, is it? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. You know what? That's his number one seller of all his books he's ever done. Yeah. You know yeah. where I found that? Value Village. Don't tell Cliff that. Oh, he doesn't know what Value Village is. I don't think they have them in the U.S. <laughs> Anyways, okay, we're getting off topic here. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're talking about planning or, you know, choosing a destination how would somebody best go about actually choosing a destination if they're new to canoeing or, or hiking? Uh, don't forget, this show isn't just about canoeing. It's about we have a lot of backpackers in here as well. Uh, you know, how, how would you go about planning a, a trip based on that? Well, okay, I'm going to go. I, I'll, do, I'll do it really quickly because there's way too much information to show you. But I'm going to show you how we used to do it and how we're doing it now. Okay. So, um Back in the late 70s, early 80s, and in fact, when I started writing guidebooks, um, I would get this book from the library, right? Actually, this is, I think, 1994, so I even did things before that. And it would give you information about canoe routes across uh, Ontario. Also, Nick Nichols, uh, if you ever find that book, uh, Nick Nichols was actually before this guy, uh, or before this book. And also, it was just an information about canoe routes. But it didn't give you all the information. It just gave you a, a sort of a brief description. And then you would have to write the government a letter, a letter, <laughs> and mail it to them. And then they would mail you a pamphlet on that particular route. So that's how we used to do that back, back, back then. And then this book came out, which is a really cool book. If you ever find this, grab it uh, if you can. Uh, Canoeing Ontario's Rivers. And uh, Ron Reed and Janet, Janet Grand from the, the Ontario Nationalists, they wrote this book about all these rivers in Ontario. So I'm like, woo, woo, this is, we're progressing, we're progressing. Instead of getting pamphlets, getting someone to write. But of course, you also know, oh my gosh, where'd he go? Um, Hal Wilson was way ahead of any of us, right? Doing his books. Mm -hmm. 
uh, right? And that, that's an old copy. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, don't throw that one away. I'll take that one off you. No, no, no. No, not that one. The second one you held up. That one? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know what? That still has the library thing on it. I, that's how my very first version of it. I should have took that back to the library. I get, I'm going to hold all the money for that. All right. <laughs> Um, and then, and then you also back back then you also had books like this, like they weren't they weren't guidebooks uh, to show you where they were, but they were journal entries. Uh, Eric Morris, he he really got me into writing and, and canoeing. Um, and then you had uh, like Ralph Bice's book, like again, it wasn't a guidebook, but you got lots of information where to go canoeing and fishing and Algonquin by that book, right? Um, and then you got you know all of a sudden it changed it to books like this where mm -hmm. you know. Here's where to go. Here's the fish. Here's the plants. Um, then you got across Canada. You got those two books. What again? They they didn't really give you that much information, but they got you going. Um, but then you got books like this or gem. Like this it, are yeah. just journal entries of all these these uh, these uh, trips people did. The the trip you did last summer is in this book. Uh, which one? The Naganash? No, the the oh, one. Up, um, Lake? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I remember reading the journal of this, and I decided not never to go on it and write about it because of what they said about this. And but you did so um, beautiful trip. Uh, well, and then you know, there's you know this guy, whatever. Oh my god, look at the friggin' goatee. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, don't 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 be modest. Uh, you can get some of those Kevin Callum oh, books here too because that's an invaluable source. Yeah, well, whatever, no, whatever. Um, uh, but also you got oh my lord, you got things like gems like this. Like you go up to um, uh, 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 Bisco Tasing and try to find information about where to go canoeing and, and the history of this. You know, you're like, what, what do I do? And I found this book. Like, it, you know, it's probably only written about five or six years ago. Yeah. Absolute gem. Absolute. Yeah. So it's not really all guidebooks per se. It's just all these books and, or stuff you find on Google, like myccr, undertook.com, um, the Gonquin Adventures, um, all those things. Probably about 20 years ago, we lived off my CCR. Like we didn't have um, all this stuff, right? So, yeah. like every my life CCR uh, has always been my go-to. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And but then you get like this. Look at this. <laughs> look at that. Yeah. Holy my God, this is um all about Little North, which is like the you know by James Bay. Look at the maps. It's incredible. And I remember uh, John Dennison, my publisher at the time, he published this book. And this is his last book before he retired and sold the business. And everybody said nobody is ever going to buy this book. It was $55 at the time, right? Yeah. And um, he said, yeah, I don't care. It's a really good book. So I'm going to go out by doing it. And actually, he sold quite a few. So. Wow. Hey, yeah. Kevin, now, now that you have the bookshelf all emptied off, you might want to dust it, eh? Good chance. I know. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> I have so many books. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. But but so th these are all great resources. But how does one select a trip that is within their yeah their capabilities? Yeah. Because you, you, a lot of people, like I said, river levels or water levels can be really high. I've got I've got that one as well. Uh, you know, you don't want to overstep your boundaries because you can get yourself into a lot of trouble if you know you're you're getting yourself on a river that. Uh, has really high conditions. I'll give everybody a case and example. Joe Robinette did an ice out trip two years ago. Remember that one? Yeah. And he thought he was going to die when he was trying to get to the portage. Yeah, it's, it's a solo pack boat. He said he almost tipped. The water was moving so fast that he had a hard time. He got out. He, the shot in the video, he's showing his hand. He's like trembling like that. He was scared. He was he was scared shitless because, yeah, you know what I mean? So yeah. how does one select something that's not within their means, right? It's uh Yeah, and, that, and that's a really good question because I get that question probably like two or three times a day. I get messages, especially this time of year. Um, know your skill set, which is not that easy to say because, um, you know, do, do you know your skill set, right? Uh, you, yeah. you might be more talented than you think or you might be just a narcissist that actually think you're really good at something and you, you don't know anything. So, but as a group, you get together if you're going to, as a group instead of a solo trip and ask everybody's skill set. So when I used to guide, um, I would hire other guides that would go as slow as the slowest per or as fast as the slowest person on the trip. And you always base your trip on that. 
you don't base your trip on the one person. Oh, I can do this. You always base it on the person. Well, I'm not sure if I can do this. So how many days do you go? How, 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 what distance you can? So these are really good questions. The average paddler, depending on the portages, the weather, whatever, can go 12 to 20 kilometers a day paddling. And you might say, well, there's a huge difference between 12 and 20. Well, all depends on a lot of things, right? But at least 12. So when you're looking at the map, you can say, well, I can go from A to B, and I at least can go 12, 20. I wouldn't push it more than 20 unless you're, you know, you're, you're a totally different person for totally different re reasons, right? And then when you're portaging, you're, well, how long would it take me to portage? Well, if you're single portaging, that's different. But I mean, really in the springtime, I would do double, which means you're three times. You go once across, come back, and once across, right? So when you look at the portage, if it's a two kilometer portage, instead of trying to calculate the, your pacing factor, which you can do because the average person goes 1.5 meters per pace, which is two, two paces, you don't do that because that'd be stupid. Um, and what you do is you go timing. If it's an okay trail, an open trail, you don't have to do a lot of blowdowns and cutting uh, wood and stuff like that. The average person goes 1,000 meters every 22 minutes with a pack on or a canoe on. Hmm. So, so that's, I mean, that's give and take, but over the years they've calculated it's 22 minutes. So if I'm doing a two kilometer portage, what I might do if I'm with another person too, and I want to make time and, 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 and go a bit quicker, I, cause I generally look at my, my canoe. I went, okay, look, I got three packs and a canoe. Why do I have to come back? Cause I can carry one pack or my, my food container with my canoe. So I'll do that. I'll take my food and my canoe, go across. And I'll, uh, at 20 minutes, if I'm doing a two kilometer portage, at, at 20 minutes, I'll put my canoe down and I'll go back to get another, another pack. The other person with me will have the other pack and they'll head right across all the way to the lake. They'll come back and pick my canoe up and do that. And then, so you're only doing a portage and a half as opposed to three. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's 22 minutes. So, and it's also 12 to 20 uh, kilometers per day, depending on what happens. Wow, you should have been a math teacher, Kevin. No, I'm terrible. Not a story writer, a math teacher. <laughs> oh, no, no, I, I'm terrible math. They, they actually asked me, asked me to teach math, and I completely, no, no. I almost yeah. didn't pass college. Uh, well, because it was in a rock band, I thought it was going to be famous. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. uh, but uh, yeah, it was my, my math. I, I, I failed surveying. I had to go back for it. Wow, crazy. Um, I want to get into like uh, gear planning and stuff like that. Just want to let everybody know uh, there's going to be an opportunity for a screenshot here in a few minutes. There, I have a uh, a, a canoe trip or a, a backcountry gear packing list that I'm going to pop up on screen. You could actually grab a screenshot of it when I'm uh, ready for that. So just uh, be know that, that 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 that's coming up. Um, so gear planning, you know, like planning for a spring trip. You mentioned earlier bring all like bring almost everything you got because you don't know what the weather's going to be like you can do a spring trip and you're going to have seven days of constant rain pouring rain after all it is spring right uh you can have rain you can have snow you can have warm temperatures you you, you never know what the weatherman's going to send your way and even when the weatherman says what he's going to send your way doesn't mean you're going to get what the weatherman is sending right yeah, so yeah. What, what, what's your what's your work around there? Uh, what 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 are essentials that you would make sure you have maybe multiples of? I would I would bring a lot of wool, like merino wool, not thick wool, but merino wool and layering. Um, and you don't bring you don't have to bring a lot of clothes, but bring clothes that actually will, if it gets wet, at least it'll give you some warmth. And um, also, uh, sleeping bags. Make sure everything is in watertight. Even though I I watertight my pack. When I put things in the pack in the waterproof uh, bag, I waterproof everything else there too. Um, really good sleeping mat to get you off the ground. So even though it's going to be a bit heavier, uh, if it's if it's good mat, uh, I, I use a, my my winter Nemo one, and I'll bring that in the springtime. I, I remember, uh, and this is really important. So I bought this one sleeping bag. I think it was from Thermarest, and it, it was a rated bag saying this is what it's rated at but the extreme level it's this oh no great look i can go to minus seven no no problem um and look it's on sale I, and i went and that was mother's day weekend where it snowed and and i was with speedo man in the tent and we should never talk about it but i got in the sleeping bag with him uh, i my sleeping bag was crap 
And what it was was when they say the rating and the extreme rating, do not believe the extreme rating. Oh. That is a sales pitch. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Don't believe in that. So uh, the comfort zone, comfort zone, right, is the the one that you should be going by. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And I always bring one of those um, SOL uh, bivvies. So I either put it over my sling bag or inside my sling bag, and that will give you another 10 degrees. And it's, it's like, you know, for 40 bucks or 50 bucks worth. No, I think it's cheaper than that, but it can't tire. It's this little bivy bag, just like the reflector bags. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's worth a fortune, like, when, when you're out there. And everybody will say, oh, can I borrow that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, another good investment would be something like a really good rain suit. Uh, don't, don't, you know, you're going to go and you can buy yourself the, the $30 one or the $150 one. And you know what? You might be better off with that $150 one as, as an investment. Just throw in a number, but you want to make sure that you have something that's got good tape seams and stuff like that. So you don't get that seepage through because yeah. water will find a way through, plain and simple. Right? Yeah, yeah. And you can look at Gore-Tex and you can look at just the Canadian Tire rain jacket. Uh, I, and my buddies, they'll, they'll, they'll do one or the other. And, you know, you know what? problem about a rain jacket is that when you sweat you'll get wet inside yeah but there's nothing really wrong with those rain jackets like they're 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 fine in the springtime just don't sweat um gore-tex you can spend a lot of money like 300 to 500 dollars on them and if you don't keep them clean or they're old um they're not going to work so it, but it's also a state of mind and chill and relax about it don't be in a rush if you guys are getting cold on the portage just stop Get a Kelly kettle going on. Get a cup of tea going. Get get some good nutrients in you, and don't be in a rush uh, because that's when accidents happen. Especially if you don't have the skill set yet. You will have the skill set. It will eventually happen. But if you don't yet, just don't rush all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh my lord, was it? Uh, uh, oh, I just saw a really good question. I lost it again. Which 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 which? No, it's your question. Uh, oh, Dennis. Could it be that one? Uh, some of your books, you have a gear list that mentions packing cotton shirts. Is there a reason cotton is mentioned specifically? No, there's no reason. I'm an idiot. Why did I ever write that? Um, it lists the mentions packing cotton shirt. No, I would not what, pack a cotton shirt. That must have been back a long time ago. I, I would, I, well, that's not true. In the summer, I would always pack a, a cotton t shirt. Uh, it was my t shirt I would wear throughout the entire summer. It was sticking hot, like, and I would wear that T-shirt for like days and days and days on end. Um, maybe that's where that came from, but no, yeah, cotton is not good. So I, idealistically, you want materials that are going to be wicking. You're going to want your your wools or your merino wools. Going to give you a really quick tip on this: two people on the merino wools. Uh, the the polyester wicking polyester works really good for a, a base layer to pull that moisture off your skin. Idea idea in in uh, springtime especially the, the cool damp springtime weather you want to make sure you are dry um uh, and then have your your <laughs> your warm layers on top of that but the, the idea just like everything you, you want to avoid hypothermia which could be more prevalent in in the springtime than it would be in the summertime obviously due to temperatures right well hypothermia is more prevalent in the shoulder season so the fall spring a yeah. lot of people, a lot of media will ask me about hypothermia in the winter. I'm like, eh, I don't know that. Well, it might happen, but it's usually in the spring and fall that was going to happen. I uh, grab, grab these. Like, go to the library if you want, and don't, don't take the book back. And <laughs> these two books, I this is how I got started. Um, yeah. I, I didn't have Google, or I didn't have Dennis' show on Tuesday night to listen to back in the 70s and 80s. I read this and I, I watched his films. I taught myself how to canoe and and and, and camp by reading his books and watching his films and then going out for countless days and doing maybe one mistake once, but never again. If you do, if you do a stupid thing twice, then you're, you're, you're stupid. But if you do it once, you learn from it. Would you, would you recommend anybody their first solo canoe trip to be a spring trip? I, I would. I may be wrong by saying that. I, I think oh. solo tripping is phenomenal. I, in, Bill Mason even said it himself, like, um, you know, traveling by yourself is dangerous, but he's never heard that from anybody that's done it. Right, right. right? So <laughs> come back alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. but, but you're more cautious when you're by yourself. You you always think you're going to die when you're on a solo trip. So you're really, really cautious of what you're doing. And I've been on trips with my buddies, and because we're all together, we think we're we're you know we're venture boys. We can do whatever we want. Like let's throw the axe at, at at Bob and see what happens, right? 
Mm -hmm. um, so when you're by yourself, and I, I know I remember I was on a, a trip with um, Ashley Speedoman on the French River, and I broke my foot in three places, and um, he got me out. And he goes, "See, so you should be going on these solo trips, you know, because this is could could happen." I went, "I would never done what I just did if I was by myself." So, but in the springtime, yeah, I, I, hypothermia is a big thing. Uh, temperature is a big thing. Gear is important. Not to say you should buy a whole bunch of gear, but uh, you you need more gear in the spring than you would summer. If something mm -hmm. goes wrong in the summer, you could probably get out of it. But if it happens in high flood water and hypothermia sets in, like, yeah, it's kind of dodgy. Yeah. I, uh, I, I mentioned I was going to give everybody a little tip. For for anybody that might be in Ontario or, or wherever there's a Costco lo location, it was at Costco uh, on the weekend. And they happened to be, I guess, trying to get rid of all their, their winter stuff, clothing, things like that. And they do carry a, a, a not bad brand of or, or line of uh, merino undergarments. And I picked up a merino wool undershirt, right, with like the little holes in the sleeve for your thumb and stuff like that, for under eight dollars. Really? So if anybody, if anybody's making a plan of the trip to Costco, you might just want to check it out. Go and check uh, in the in the men's clothing or the women's clothing area there. Uh, you never know; you might get a good deal on some uh, merino wool. Uh, or is it merino wool or merino wool blend? Uh, either either way, uh, they're moisture wicking. They're they're a pretty nice uh, unit, and for you know under ten dollars, the regular price on them is like twenty nine dollars or something, or thirty nine dollars or whatever. So yeah. good opportunity if they have them in stock anymore. I also picked up just regular ski gloves, and they were like under ten dollars too. I got some great, uh, great shirts, uh, wool, wool shirts from the Army, Army Surplus. Yep. And also uh, some really good stuff from the Sally Ann or whatever those places, right? That, yeah. So uh, it, it's a great time. My, my daughter and I, that's what we do. We, we go out to those places and she gets her hip garments for high school and I get my camping gear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, I, I have an allergy to wool, right? So I, I curse that because I'll tell you, there's nothing worse that, or nothing more that I would want than a really nice wool blanket to camp with, or, you know, the, the nice wool sweater, like, you know, the big, uh, anorak type of wool sweaters, or I, I can't wear it, man. <laughs> this guy gets all, all red and veiny and ivy and itchy. <laughs> so it's like, damn it. But the Merino wool, I, I, I started out with Merino wool socks to try it out and it, I'm okay with that. So, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, merino, merino wool is a lot better than the, the wool that your your grandma netted you, right? I mean, yeah. It's lightweight. It's expensive though. The guy, I love wool power. Like, uh, where's my sweater? Well, I got this, but my I had my sweater on today when I was out in the woods all day, and um, I I think I own I bought that at the outdoor show probably 1996, and I, I it nothing's wrong with it. This here, like, mm -hmm. I, I love this. Oh my god, I I, I want to be. Buried in this. Can you mark that down, Dennis? I want to be buried in this sweater. Okay. Uh, anybody, any lawyers in here that we could put that in as well? Or? Sure. <laughs> uh, Dan Millot's actually saying alpaca, alpaca wall is very good for those who are sensitive to sheep wool. So I've heard that. Uh, just trying to find it is, is my problem, right? But uh, yeah. Um, okay. So. We're getting close to, well, we're at 8 o'clock, and I want to do the swag giveaway. Um, one thing I do want to cover also there are, like, you know, uh, booking of, I, and I tried to get somebody on last second. I apologize to anybody that's in here from Algonquin Outfitters. I, I, I reached out here today. It was rather late on the reach out uh, to try and get somebody on panel. But I wanted to talk about, like, you know, renting gear and stuff like that. Uh, but I, I can't go on record as to say that any gear that you're going to try and rent right now, just like trying to buy a new canoe or, uh, you know, any any paddling gear is, is getting harder to come by the closer that we get to the season. So if you're going to do anything like that, now is the time to do it. Now should be the planning or the time that you're planning your, your spring trips, whether it's a hiking trip or a canoeing or a kayaking adventure. Um, if you're planning on doing it in the spring, you don't want to be disappointed. And you might also want to look into booking now, as Kevin said, everything's getting filled up at the parks. Like it, the, everything's getting snapped up, right? Take care of it now because uh, even if you have to book and you have to cancel, don't like saying that because like, you know, you don't want to take a spot that somebody else can occupy. But if you have a pretty good uh, inkling that you're going to be going at a certain time, try and book it now because now's the time to do it. Yeah, well, and Nate, Nate's here. He, he's uh, he's the Huntsville guy from. Yeah, Gold. that's true. Actually, Nate, if you want to pop up after the swag giveaway, uh, I'll uh, I'll drop the link here in the uh, 
in the in the chat because I will invite a couple people up to ask questions uh, shortly. But uh, Nate, if you're interested in joining for a few minutes, uh, here's the link. No, no, Nate goes on and on. He never he never stops. He never shuts up. <laughs> yeah, that's because he knows stuff, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let, let's do the swag giveaway. Hey, can I get you uh, then while you're doing that? Yeah, you go for it. I'll, I'll go full screen and we'll see you in a minute. Okay. Okay, guys and gals. So here we are. Uh, hopefully everybody was paying attention towards the beginning of the show because I actually give a wink, nudge, and another wink as to uh, kind of what our, our swag giveaway is going to be based on tonight. Uh, I'm just going to put my banners up here. Uh, I'm going to give you the question here in a second, and we're going to be doing two swag giveaways, and I'm going to ask the question, but I ask that you please do not put your answer into the uh, the chat over here. I want you to please email your address or your answer over to coasprize at gmail.com. It's going across the bottom of the screen there now. And you have until Saturday to get your answer in. If you do submit an incorrect answer, I will have the courtesy or, or I will have the courtesy to let you know that uh, you have given an incorrect answer, give you the chance to correct that. I want everybody to have a chance to uh, to win swag uh, when they're here on the show. So tonight's question is going to be simple. Name two of Canoe Hound's Outdoor Adventure Show's business, business sponsors or business supporters. I mentioned it at the beginning of every show uh, in my pre-show intro uh, before we get into our topic. And if you're unsure, so it'll be like in the first seven or eight minutes of the video. And uh, yeah, you know, all you got to do is send me two of them, right? And uh, cheers, everybody. So anyways, all you need to do is answer that question. Send me the uh, answer to COS prize, and uh, we will uh, be drawing two. So what we'll be winning this week is the usual, a Canoe Hound Adventures prize package, which is going to consist of two of our patches, iron-on patches, as well as a decal pack these can be stuck to your water bottle lunch pail bumper of your car uh, granny's forehead anything like that and then we also have from our good friends over at algonquin outfitters uh we have uh a few goodies from them sticker and uh a voucher for either a uh a good sizable amount off of purchase or a free rental so that's going to be going to two lucky winners and uh just like our winners from last week It'll be in the mail the day after we, we actually send that through to you. Okay, so Kevin, I believe, is still off screen. I believe he's re still freshening up his drink. I'll leave the uh, question and the answer thing for floating across the bottom there for a few minutes. And uh, we do have a guest here in the basement here with a question, I'm sure. And uh, we got Mark from the OG in the Canoe. How are you doing tonight, Mark? Not too bad. Yourself, Dennis? Good, man. Good, man. Good. What you got tonight? Uh, what I got tonight, uh, well, I mean, other than enjoying the show. Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> no, it's a. Uh, I actually put a question up earlier, and when when me and my buddy John tri plan trips, we'll get out the map, and we're like, okay, well, where do we go? And then we'll just say, okay, well, we'll go from here to here to here to here. And then what we do is like, you know, we'll use the legend at the bottom with the with the scale, and one of us will pick a piece of string, and we'll calculate what what every day will be to see if it's plausible. And I was just wondering how many people did that, if maybe. You know, Kevin did that back in the day or still does it or something like that, you know? Yeah. Did you catch that question, uh, Kevin? Just the end. Uh, uh, what what should I be doing now? <laughs> he's he's yeah. asking, like, he, he says that him and his buddies, when they're uh, setting up their thing, they'll use, like, the string according to the legend on the map, and they'll, they'll map out their distances. Is oh, that yeah. the type of process you use? Oh, yeah. God, yeah. Uh, um, so uh, what he's talking about, a great video that you did. That, that was great. Thanks. Yes. Um, so you got a top of map or even any other map. And if you look at the, uh, the, not longitude, latitude, they're not that it, UTM coordinates, the blue lines going that way and this way, all those squares, I don't know if I have a map here. Uh, I don't, but they're a thousand meters apart, no matter the scale. Right? So what you would do is you get your compass and your compass has a necklace uh, around it over here. Right? So I would actually say you're doing a river. I would you know, put this along the river like this, and then I would put it along the map, and I would count the squares, and that would give you your distance, okay? Uh, I mean, or you could look at the scale and figure that out yourself, but that's a lot quicker, especially if you're not really good with math. Yeah, well, what we what we do is we'll just take the scale and say, you know, like, you know, an inch represents this much, and especially for rivers, we'll just go down and we'll figure out, okay, well, this is, you know, so many kilometers this day, and then we'll see if it's actually plausible 
you know, depending on how many meters of portage we have to do, how many, you know, how many kilometers of paddle we have to do and whatnot. So like I said, to me, it's, it's, it's kind of like an old school technique. And I was just curious that people actually still did that because that's what we do. Well, or you use your GPS and it tells you. Um, oh, the GPS is cheating. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I started GPSing. Uh, it's funny. I teach GPSing, but I've always used Map and Compass because when I was working in forestry and fish and wildlife, that's what I used and that's what I'm comfortable with. But then my buddy Andy, he got into GPSing. And then finally at Christmas, he bought me one. I don't know, I just got him something really cheap. He got me a GPS for the love of God. But um, but I said, well, what's with this? He goes, oh, I'm tired of you asking me where we are. So uh, yeah, so you can use your GPS or your phone. Your phone would work too. You don't need uh, your phone to have um, Wi-Fi when you're using it as a GPS. Yeah. Right? But um, I still do this uh, or I eyeball it. So say I'm going across Obiongo Lake or Lake Superior or whatever. I look at my top of map and I count the squares. So I go, okay, well that's six squares, that's 6,000 meters, that's six kilometers. I paddle 12 to 20 per day, so I could probably go two kilometers per hour if, if, if weather is good. So I calculate it on that. Yeah, so, so right. we, try, we try and use the GPS just when we're like really stuck. You know, like we, we use the, uh, there's a, a, I think it's a Visa or Vita or something like that on the iPhone. So we use that. We we did our first trip with a GPS, and I found like I was trying to I was trying to look at it too much to see where 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 are we where are we, and then the second time we went back, we kind of just did it just with the map, and I found that was so much more enjoyable because you're reading the lay of the land a little bit more. You're not you know you're not depending on you know this little arrow that says that, you know the portage should be that way. You know? Yeah, so, yeah, that, that's what I feel about maps too. Is the fact that you could read that map and you could follow it. You know, like okay, there's that cove and there's the little island there, yeah. and it, yeah, it, it gives you a better read of the land for sure. You can actually learn a lot just by looking at the map and then looking at the topography of the, of the landscape. Yeah. Right. So yeah, I mean, the only thing about a, a map and a GPS, the GPS wins over. Well, two things. One is if uh, your your compass doesn't work because you're in the far north and the declination is out going up, going crazy. But the other is before we had a GPS, if we had to find out where we were on the map, so you can find out where to go on the map, but where where are we? You would have to find a, a somewhere in your landscape and identify it on the map, like a hillscape or a tower or, some or sort. a valley. Or you, have cross, you have to cross it. So you take a, a heading, a heading, and then do the opposite, the reciprocal, and then where they cross is where you are. You just push a button on GPS and tells you where the, you are. Yeah. Because if, if I, I'll go over that with my students and you know, I'll take a half a day with them doing it and they'll like, are we ever gonna do this, Kevin? No, they're like, I'm confused, Kevin. I, I'm going to die out here. Like, can we go home? So, yeah, see, see, that's I, I think ultimately though, the, the more tools that you have at your disposal while you're out there, uh, you know, a, a GPS unit, like a Garmin GPS, your map, uh, you know, it could be a Google Maps picture, something along that lines. It could be your phone, uh, you know, with the satellite, if you have a way of downloading the maps uh, onto your phone or something. The the more tools that you have at your, your disposal, the better off you're going to be when you're in the backcountry, right? Yeah. And Dan, yeah, thank you. That's strangulation. Um, and also, uh, Matt, uh, the, the uh, what three words? Uh, it's a really good idea for people to do that. Just make sure you download it before you go on the trip. Uh, I, I think it's a really good app. I, I wouldn't. De I, I get really concerned about so many people depending on something like that and not the skill set. And I'm I'm not doing an Uncle Kev here. I'm, I'm telling you right now. If you just put an app on your phone before you go out and say, "Oh no, no worry, guys, we'll be fine. I got this new app." Um, I'll be looking for you. Okay, I'll I'll be doing this <laughs> for you. Okay, so you you need. <laughs> And I do sound like I'm doing a, a rant, whatever, and I'm Irish and Scottish, so I will do a rant, whatever, but take your time to do the skill set. And it's it's enjoyable. Like today, for example, I went out in the bush today and you know I, I did a whole bunch of stuff on my, my YouTube, whatever, but I found a bunch of other things I didn't know, right? And I, I really enjoyed the day because if you think you're stop if you think you know everything, you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just I just want to say something before you let the bring whoever else up. Um, just a quick tip. I don't know if anybody uses the same tip as I do before we go on, especially on an ice out trip. Um, I'll just take a screenshot of like the weather, even though weather changes, yeah. I'll just take a screenshot of the weather because like you don't have that access out there. 
and it gives you a good idea what the lo- the lows and the highs are going to be for the day and if it's going to rain or if it's going to you know if they're announcing snow or whatnot so like i said weather does change but uh, yeah. it, it gives you a good basis you know yeah for, for weather too like um andy when we do big trips like georgian bay or up, up north lake superior he has a um a weather radio uh, and and I wouldn't pack it because I don't have the muscle he does. And he, he, he can carry, like, a house and he'll be fine. Like, the one canoe, like, we're, we're planning a trip for uh, June for the far north, and he's bringing his 102-pound canoe, right? And it's an 18-foot down, uh, uh, you know, the old-fashioned uh, Nova craft. I said, you know, if you die, I'll walk out and leave you in the canoe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not carrying that, but but um, but he he brings that. Uh, what I do though too is, and I I really practiced this skill for many years. Uh, Christine, I'm not sure if she's really listening anymore. Um, uh, uh, my my partner, whatever, but she'll tell you. I can look at the weather and the time, and I know the time exactly. I don't know what I did in my life, but I'll tell you what time it is, and I'll know what weather's coming in. Yeah, you've been pretty good at that. I've seen that. <laughs> I think it's because it's bush time. I, I was I spent so much time in the woods, and and I, I just got that skill. And uh, I didn't really notice it until her and I were going on a trip together. And she goes, "You're weird, man." <laughs> I think she said that right in a video. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Mark. Uh, stick around in the green room there. I might get you back up in a little while there. All right, take it easy, guys. Hey, buddy. Thanks. Bye. But we got a couple of questions here. I just wanted to address here in the thing. Uh, two really quick ones here, Kevin. And then we're going to get it, into a little more specifics with clothing and stuff like that. But uh, Two's Cruise is asking, anyone know where you can get a reference of a uh, copy of Jeff's Algonquin map for Avenza? If anybody knows, please drop it in the uh, the chat over there and uh, maybe help. Uh... Yeah, Christine will. She found that out for me. Um, and yeah, I just noticed she, she's, on, she's online. So... Uh, Christine, can you tell people how you got that? Okay, yep. Yeah. She could put that in the chat or maybe uh, reach out to Kevin, perhaps. Maybe he could help you out there. And then we got, uh, let's see here. This one here I've seen a couple of times. Uh, Matthew's asking, have you ever tried using the What's Three Words app for coordinate locations? Dennis. You heard about that? That sounds really unique. We've already answered that question, Dennis. Move on. No, no. The What Three Words? <laughs> have we? Yeah, we did. Oh, I, I said it was really good, but just know your skill set and don't d- depend on it. But it's a good, it's a good uh, app. Yeah, because that words, eh? Like they could, they're just random words, and that could pinpoint you within like. Yeah, I'm not like, sure. I don't think that it it got, does launch a lot to you. I think it runs off uh, UTM coordinates, which are different, right? Yeah. I'm not sure if everybody knows the difference, launch and latitude are what we always use on our regular uh, GPSs and our on our cars and whatever. But UTM was created in World War II, so they can actually pinpoint more for for bombardments. And um, it's just a different system, but it's more accurate. And uh, uh, so you can change your GPS to do uh, UTM instead of latitude and longitude, not longitude and latitude. Um, if you want, you just have to know what you're talking about when you use it. Mm-hmm. And then here, here's a r- kind of random question here from Coolquest. Uh, what's the word on, lo- on Lastify? Anybody know what's going on with Unlostify these I days? Love, I would love someone to answer that. I have no clue. Yeah, Jeff's maps. I'd love to get Jeff McMurtry on uh, on the show one time here to, to talk about all that. But uh, there again, I, I'm not too uh, too up on what's going on there as well. So, yeah. Okay, so I'd like to talk a bit about, uh, we talked a bit about clothing, merino wool, you know, rain gear, stuff like that. But one, one thing that we didn't talk about is the all important, and this goes for both canoeing, kayaking, and hiking is the importance of footwear, footwear that's going to keep you dry. Hiking trail, obviously you need something that's going to be comfortable, uh, you know, not going to be causing you blisters, uh, something that's going to be waterproof, good ankle support. What about in the canoe world? What do, what do we need for, for good footwear when it comes to paddling? Man, you get the debates going. You just muster it all up, boy. Like, I'm telling you. Damn it. <laughs> I, 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 you know, if I had a list, a whole bunch of uh, major paddling debates, uh, one of the biggest is uh, footwear. I, Cliff Jenkins and I still, like, we we're on radio last week talking about it, debating. So I'll tell you what I use. I don't care what you use. Um, I really don't, as long as you go out there and, and comfortable about it. But I'll tell you what I use. So I, I wear hiking boots um, that are up to the ankle. And um, the moment I get to... 
the lake to put the canoe in, I walk in the water. I do not try to keep my feet dry all day because you will not. If you buy, if you buy Gore-Tex boots that will keep you dry, are you freaking kidding me? When you're on a portage, it's up to your knees at times. So to, to actually have waterproof hiking boots with Gore-Tex that cost you 500 bucks, I don't get it, right? You could wear uh, rubber boots, knee-high rubber boots, which are a really good idea, especially in the spring and fall. I, I think they're really good, but you will get blisters and you will overheat. Um, you can get those neoprene boots um, that are really good too. Uh, you'll, you, your feet will really stink, like really bad. Uh, but what I do is the moment I get to camp, I take my, my wet boots off and then I put moccasins or other sneakers on and change my feet to make sure my feet are okay. So Cliff will, will always say, well, geez, Kevin, and he's got a point. I, I, Cliff always has a really good point. When you're doing some rapids and you flip and you got these big hikers on, you're going to sink like a stone, right? Mm -hmm. like, yes. Yes, I will. But the chance of me turning an ankle on a portage, especially on a solo trip, compared to actually flipping in a rapid, I'm going to flip my ankle. So I'd rather be, you know, have a solid ankle support and not worry about flipping in the rapid. Because when I'm, especially when I'm solo, I'll look at the rapid and if I think even I maybe won't make it, I won't do it. Yeah. Have you ever tried those waterproof socks? Yeah. Um, I have for hiking trips. Okay. And they work the same as uh, as um, as um, bread bags, so you might as well just wear bread bags. The same thing. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, they work. Um, and I, I I've used them in the spring and fall for when I would take students out. Um, the last few years, I I got them. I got them from Tim at Canadian Equipment. He, I bought some off him. Vapor vapor barrier socks. Um, I've also used um, neoprene socks. Uh, some I think someone asked too about. Um, uh, neoprene booties and neoprene, um, we call it chicken vests, um, in the spring. I think they're fantastic. Uh, yes, I wear merino wool, whatever, but to have those on, especially if you're doing whitewater, you actually have to have that. Or a dry suit if you're doing major whitewater in the spring. Mm -hmm. And we got Nate Muscate. Uh, Nate Musco over there. How are you doing, Nate? I'm out of here. <laughs> really, really quick, I got to post a question here from Paul Hoy, and this is a topic that I, I'd like to bring up one day because I'll tell you, I'd like to uh, to learn a little bit more about this myself because uh, I have to persuade my wife to get back out. She had a couple of bad experiences that have uh, kept her basically from tripping with me anymore. So uh, we, we'll talk about that maybe as having a show, but uh, we'll keep we'll keep that one. We'll keep one. <laughs> Nate, how is it going, man? How's it going? Great, thanks. Good. So you, I don't, I don't know why you're so quick to evade my company, considering you seem to have identified yourself as a as a library thief. <laughs> I don't really. You know what? Oh my lord, the auto on one also. Yeah. Uh oh. Yeah, oh, wait a minute. The, over, the overdue fines on that must be uh, like, are you just waiting for one of those amnesty days? I remember I always waited for amnesty days. Yeah, because the, the the pandemic closed all the libraries, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Nate, what, what can you add in about uh, about the whole? Um, I guess we were talking like the, the whole rental thing with with uh, what's coming up with the spring season. How how are things going at Algonquin Outfitters right now with uh, bookings of rentals? Yeah, so for I can only speak to uh, what I see in my little corner of Huntsville. Um, and the, the feedback I get from our Oxton Lake location, which is our rental hub, which sees the vast majority of the, the rental kind of phone calls and inquiries. Uh, but I can tell you right now, um, we thought last year it was busy and this year is busier. And that's reflected in, uh, in the article that Ontario Parks posted, I think, four or five days ago now, which I'm sure most people on here have seen. Uh, indicating that uh, reservations for the, you know, for the, I think, four or five week period from uh, the first week of January to the first week of February um, are up 100% from last year, which was a staggeringly busy year. So uh, as far as July and August goes, if you're planning on doing anything, I hope it's midweek and I hope you're planning on booking it very, very soon. 
Mm -hmm. Nate, is there any chance you can get a little closer to your microphone? We a lot of people are saying they could hardly hear you there. Oh shoot, sorry. Yeah, start over. Hard. No. <laughs> so basically, what Nate has been saying is that uh, their their rental is like kind of up about a hundred percent over last season, which was up like probably a hundred percent over the season previous, right? So very busy, very busy. Yeah, I, I would just reiterate that if you're if you're planning on um, doing a, a trip in July and August, as far as the backcountry goes, I hope it involves uh, weekdays, and I hope you're planning on on booking very soon. Yeah, yeah, and I mentioned that earlier that uh, now's the time to book. Get get in there if you kind of know your dates. You can get in there with a ballpark figure and yep, the, get it all figured out. The phone calls, uh, the phone calls are coming in thick and fast uh, daily already. Even at our Huntsville location, which usually serves access points one through three, um, and then Brent, um, and so to, to have that kind of volume of volume of phone calls already at this point, uh, we're not even in March, um, and people are wanting to rent canoes and, and planning trips for even those three access points that the Huntsville store serves. It's kind of an indicator of, of how parks in this region and especially Algonquin, uh, how busy they're going to be um, starting, I'm guessing, kind of the last week of June. Mm -hmm. So I guess Canoe Hound better get planning on his uh, Brent run that I wanted to do this year, right, before I, I can't book it. Yeah, crazy. So on the retail end of side or of things, what what is, what is Algonquin Outfitters finding is really hot right now as far as uh, – spring gear things things for the spring uh trip planning season like uh what, what's the big seller right now what are people grabbing up um i mean we're, we're shipping out a lot of stuff uh as far as serving our our market base in this area um it's still winter here um i mean i just spent most of the day shoveling off my roof and at some of the points where it's gathered in drifts i'm up to my hip um so uh, you know, the ski hills are now up and, and uh, there's still lots of people, you know, winter camping on Crown Land and things like that. And so we're very, very busy still selling snowshoes and still selling Nordic equipment. Um, but as for forecasting in the spring, um, canoe packs uh, are selling quite quickly right now. Um, and then we are starting to get demand for things like... Um, for stuff that we we ran out of quite quickly last year, and that was like certain models of uh, sleeping pads, sleeping bags, um, backpacks, paddle lengths, PFDs. PFDs are a big one. Um, if you're looking for a nicer PFD for yourself, like a you know a, a you know a nice fitting Salus model that maybe you weren't able to get your hands on last year, find it now um, because by the time July rolls around. Um, it'll be scarce and yes uh will we sell out of freeze-dried food and fuel this year it's quite likely you know it's not like we're the only region in north america that's seen this kind of demand and manufacturers can only make so much and they're also lagging behind in manufacturing just like we're all lagging behind um in in other stuff <laughs> because of because of COVID, uh, and they can only make so much. Um, so, um, as far as certain types of fuel and food, uh, you know, stock now, get a dehydrator, um, do what you can do to plan for the trip that you know you're going to go on, um, and uh, be prepared uh, because buying it the week before this year is not a good idea. Yeah. You know, I, I, I find that myself personally for any trip, any, any, uh, whether it's spring, summer, winter, fall, I, I don't rely on, uh, the store bought meals. One, they're too expensive. Uh, usually a lot of them are really high in sodium, which, you know, could be good if you're, you're losing a lot of sodium, uh, you know, through your sweat and stuff like that. But you know what? The, the, the food, dehydrated food, I think is, is so good. I'll, I'll always bring a, a freeze dried meal or two just on the in case that I need it. And usually they end up coming home with me. But like, you know, I, I enjoy my freeze dry or not freeze dried, my uh, dehydrated meals that I made myself for pennies on a dollar. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, you've got it. I've got, I've got probably 30 meals sitting downstairs right now, uh, waiting for my, you know, 
paddle season. So yeah. it's mm-hmm. uh the other thing we're anticipating this year, and, and I think it's kind of a good thing, although it just places more demand on our product versus the supply we're able to get, is that all these people <laughs> that we know uh, went out for maybe their first time into the backcountry last year, and uh, they learned a thing or two after that experience, they're now looking to maybe purchase gear instead of rent gear. Um, they're looking to... Uh, buy equipment that they know they missed on their last trip and maybe even though that last trip they were missing some stuff and they had you know maybe subpar rental gear for what they were doing this year they're trying to make up for that because guess what the only thing on their list to do this summer is that camping trip for whatever reason Um, and so that's going to place a little bit more demand on the retail market I think uh, for people to, you know, people looking to buy gear instead of rent it this time around or um, get something that they missed the last time around that they, they want to make sure they have. Um, and so there will be extra demand on, on that side of it as well. Mm-hmm. So on, on with like the, the, the clothing end of things, um, being a, a retail manager yourself, you, you, you know what the products are, what, like, can you throw up a, a toss at us a, a couple of good brands that somebody might look for when it comes to maybe rain gear or, uh, you know, like uh, a good uh, undergarments or, or things that are going to keep them dry during the, the spring season? Um, yeah, for, for spring, you want wool, like Kevin was saying. And I'll say that um, merino wool differs widely in price. Um, there is always a label affixed to the inside of the garment at some point along the seam usually near the lower part of the torso where wherever you buy it and whatever you buy make sure you look at that label and make sure the price you're pairing paying reflects the blend of merino wool in the garment mm-hmm. um so obviously 100 percent merino wool is fantastic um uh sometimes that'll be kind of second or third grade wool but it's still 100 percent merino wool um but oftentimes, if you look on that inside tag, it'll say, you know, 17, 17% or 26% merino wool, um, and the rest is polyester or polyester and nylon. And so you really want to make sure that you're getting kind of a, a fair deal for the price you're paying for quote unquote uh, merino wool. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, wool is fantastic. Um, in a pinch, um, good old fashioned polar fleece. Uh, works quite well because it will often kind of retain some of its thermal value when it's wet. Um, polyester is really good at wicking moisture away from you, you know, like on that portage, uh, not so much being that kind of warm layer you want to throw on when you get to camp to kind of w- help warm you up. Um, so I think you guys have been talking a lot about really good pieces uh, uh, of base layers to bring with you, but I think the one thing that I know comes in really handy when you start hanging out at camp or right when you get to camp before you start setting up, you just need to warm up. Um, It's that really packable down puffy or a synthetic puffy. Um, And that can help, you know, a good one doesn't need to be really thick and it it doesn't need to be really heavy or jam packed full of down like you'd see, uh, you know, someone wearing when it's minus 30 out. Uh, but we all know there's a ton of them out there, you know, the, the North Face Thermoball series, um, you know, Marmot, uh, Arcteryx, um, I don't know, you know, even the Markswork Warehouse, uh, you know, private label makes, uh, makes a passable, packable insulator that's easy just to compress, stick it in. And when you need something, when you start to get the shivers, uh, you need somebody to throw it on. It, it goes a long way. Um, obviously down is going to be superior to synthetic that way. Um, but synthetic, a good, um, a good synthetic such as Prima loft or core loft, uh, will, will work quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, what? it's amazing. Those puffy jackets uh, for, for the weight of them and, uh, like, you know, the bulk of them, which is like next to nothing in most cases, how warm they actually are. Uh, my everyday wear, wear, wear in the wintertime here uh, is just a, a Columbia uh, downfield jacket. And I'll wear that out there like, uh, you know, minus. I wouldn't want to hang out in it all day if I was out, outdoors all day. But uh, 
like, you know, for, for driving your vehicle or, or whatever. It's amazing how down works to keep you wool or warm, right? Or just like the, the wool itself, right? Or wool itself. It's, it's yeah. so warm and cozy. Yeah. What about what about footwear? What what type of uh, footwear is you would you say are? Uh... Yeah, I, I'm I'm with Kevin on that one. You can pay three hundred dollars for a pair of really nice Gore-Tex hiking boots, and then um, as soon as the water comes over the top of them, you pay three hundred dollars for a bread bag in a shoe filled with water. Yeah. Um, so as long as you realize that at some point getting in and out of your canoe, especially if this is a spring trip or you're going to be getting in and out of your canoe, you know, at a site where maybe there's some slushy stuff before you can get to your campsite or the portage, etc., etc., your feet are going to get wet. And so you just need to be prepared for that and plan around it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, stiff Gore-Tex hiking boots are great on a, you know, on a trail hike where you're encountering, you know, some mud puddles and, and some slushy snow and things like that. They're not great for, in a pinch, having to hop out of your canoe in three feet of water to drag it to shore. So figure it out. Um, I agree. Waterproof socks aren't the answer because they're just like another bread bag. I, I found that one out the hard way when you pull off your fancy waterproof sock off of your foot and it looks like a the you know it looks like a limb from a cadaver um <laughs> but um you know again wool socks help um everyone has their own version of the footwear they don't mind popping out of the water with to get wet i would just combine that uh with a good insulating layer uh that you're able to replace easily with something in your pack should it become cold Mm -hmm. Cause there, there again, even in a canoe, like, you know, if you're paddling in a rain, uh, you know, or, or the cold, you could be having snow coming down. You're going to want to make sure that your feet are, are remaining warm because if you're just sitting there in a canoe and you're paddling along, usually it's the first things that get cold on you are going to be your fingertips and your, your toes, just like in the winter time. Right. So yeah, I could see the, the hiking boot thing. Um, wouldn't like, Kevin said, I wouldn't want to be trying to swim with that. It'd be like a brick uh, on your foot. But I seen somebody also posted in there Crocs. Uh, they'll wear Crocs in the canoe. Uh, and last time I did an ISO trip in the canoe, I would usually use my Crocs with a pair of warm socks inside of them, right? Yeah, I, I would say um, your feet even more so than your fingers while you're paddling in the cold because your fingers are moving, your arms are moving, yeah. your wrists are moving. And that's keeping blood going to your to your hands, but your feet are just kind of sitting there. Either you're cross-legged or you're kneeling or they're propped up in front of you. Uh, and so there's really not a lot of activity going there to get blood pumped down to your toes, to your extremities. Um, and so, yeah, having, having some way to keep them warm, even in damp, cold weather is key. You know, as, as kind of silly or namby-pamby as it sounds, um, the little hot toes packs or the heater packs that you can pick up for a couple bucks here and there. And I know some may poo poo it, but having those as a backup, um, to, uh, the, you know, the charcoal heater packs that you mm -hmm. open up aerate for a couple minutes to get the reaction going to create warmth. Oh, Kevin's getting ready for a rebuttal here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyways, ha having those as a backup, because I think they're, I don't know, two or three bucks a pair. They they can sit in your pack for two or three years before they don't work anymore. But when your feet start getting real cold and you don't have an, an easy alternative way to warm them up without pulling the canoe over somewhere, those are fantastic to stick um, either on the insole of your footwear or even on the top of your foot where the veins are pumping blood into your toes. And then that way you're warming up the blood um, on, you know, in your veins that's pumping out to your toes. And they they work for, for quite a while. Um, I mean, for two or three bucks, they can keep your feet warm in a pinch for like four mm -hmm. or five hours. So, But they don't work in a wet boot. <laughs> right. They will. They will work in a wet boot if you oh, give, really? if you give them time in the air beforehand to yeah. let the action take place to the point where they're getting that really nice and warm. 
Yeah. Okay, because I've always found with those things that once you do put them in a boot or something, maybe, maybe I'm not doing it right. Maybe I'm not giving them enough air long enough to uh, to get them to heat up. But I find every time that when they get into a concealed area and they're, they you know use up the oxygen in there, they 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 stop heating. Yeah, right if there. you can just if you can keep them a little bit dry and feed them a bit of oxygen, <laughs> yeah, um, then uh, they're quite effective actually, and they're and they're. Uh, for this for the size and the weight of them they're not a bad thing to carry as, as backup because they they are effective yeah yeah really quick here and i'll, I'll ask you on this one too no wrong one uh moving too quick this chat sometimes uh mark who's still in the basin asked about fjall ravens uh they they usually dry out really well and quick uh what do you guys think anything you found that works better for a quick dry pant in the uh springtime cool. oh fell raven bands are really good uh, yeah I, I know others that dry quicker. The old uh, MEC quick dries, but they don't make them anymore. Mm -hmm. um, they were really good as long as you wear something underneath, like if it was cold out, uh, long underwear. Um, but, yeah, just don't wear blue jeans. Yeah. Yeah, I, I used to wear just the uh, Columbia quick dry pants. Uh, they, yeah, they, they work really well, but like you say, they're they're fairly thin. They're great in the summertime, uh, but uh, in, in the cooler weather, You'd want to wear definitely a, a moisture wicking uh, undergarment. Yeah. Yeah. Someone mentioned um, uh, earlier on about a poncho, a rain poncho, and um, they they work. I just you need to be warned about that. Um, they're they're death machines. So uh, I was going on a solo trip down the Mississippi River, and uh, I came around. I was in the middle of nowhere. I forget the rapid. I think it was twelve mile rapids, whatever. And they were they, they were doing a search and rescue for this guy, and what happened was he went over the last drop. Um, and flipped and he was wearing a poncho and it was one of those washing machine rapids and it was the poncho that pushed him down and they were, you know, he, he died. So uh, just keep an eye on that. I know my, my buddy Tim, uh, he wears a poncho all the time, swears by them, he loves them, but if you ever went into the drink wearing one of those, I don't know, I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, I, I think you'd want to make sure you can lose it real quick in a pinch. That's that's a tricky one, even though it, it does provide a good amount of like, you know, kind of rainproof, windproof coverage really easily and still keeps your arm free, your arms free. But yeah, there's a, <laughs> you give up something with it, I think. Um, as far as the Fjall pants go, it, yeah, they, they make fantastic pants and uh, they make very nice fitting pants and, and they're breathable and you can wax them and, and I love them. Um, I would say if you if you own some and you haven't waxed them yet, I would wax them strategically ahead of canoe season and and uh, basically wax the knees and the butt um, because that's where you're gonna want the waterproofness versus the breathability of that garment uh, specifically. Um, but a, a decent soft shell will work really well for spring paddling as well because there's. Uh, a bit of water repellency built in there. There's obviously some some windproofness built in there. There's a little bit of thermal value as well. Uh, you know, the marmot scree pant is kind of like a you know one of those staples in the outdoor world that, uh, that a lot of people are familiar with. And uh, there's a number there's a number of companies that have iterations of that soft shell pant that are worth checking into. Also, they tend to have a, a little bit of stretch built into them, which is rather comfy. Uh, there's a couple Fjall uh, pants that do as well, of course. Um, but yeah, I would say that the Fjall Raven, <coughs> the Fjall Raven, the Raven pants, and the um, and a good soft shell pant, a good heavy soft shell pant with a bit of stretch to it, works yeah. really, really well for spring paddling. Yeah, and you know what? Just uh, just to let everybody know too, if you do have the Fjall Raven pants, don't forget to to uh, to wax those things. Uh, Every once in a while, I actually bought my Fjall Raven wax from uh, Algonquin Outfitters right off of Nate Muskoka here himself. And uh, I waxed them a couple times, and I'll tell you, it goes a long way to, one, repelling the water, and two, helping them to uh, to dry. And especially on the backside, uh, you know, if you, you happen to be sitting on stuff that uh, that might be wet, it could be a wet canoe seat, it could be a wet rock, uh, you know, uh, a wet bench in a campsite or something, it, it really helps to uh, to definitely repel water. And so I guess you could say that the first way of dry or best way to dry off is not to get wet in the first place. Right. So, yeah. 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 Another thing I want to touch on too, that we haven't really touched on so far is uh shelter. Um, 
you know, protecting yourself in the elements, uh, whether it be a tent uh, or, you know, a very good quality uh, tarp that you're going to string up over your camp. Because if you are spring camping, whether it's hiking or canoeing or kayaking, uh, if you're in the back country and you know it's it's springtime, it's going to rain on you. Let, let's face it, right? Um, the best thing to do is, is being able to string up a, a tarp. Uh, first thing, learning how to put properly put up a tarp so that you can get it up in a, uh, a quick situation where, you know, if it's already raining, you want to get it up quick to try and keep yourself as dry as possible. If it's a uh, threatening rain, you want to get it up quick. It could actually be or should actually be one of the first things you set up in your camp. Agreed? Absolutely. The, the tarp is 100% more important than the tent. Uh, yeah. not just for protection, but for communal, uh, groups. Um, if you st spend your time inside the tent to d deal with bad weather, you'll hate the person you're with, even if you're solo. Uh, and, um, it, like it's a, it's a dog, dog house, right. But if you get a tarp up and when I got it too, the very first thing I did is get a tarp up and did a very, a whole bunch of ways to put a tarp up, uh, all depends on, on, on the weather. And then you get a fire going and you can put a fire under a tarp. All these people say, we can't have a, tar a fire under the tarp. You just don't have a ma major bonfire, but mm -hmm. there's no reason at all why you can't have a fire under the tarp. Yes, it's nylon. Just don't have it skyrocketing with sparks flying, whatever. Um, or angle it so the fire is in front of you and the tarp's behind you. So you have sort of that, that layer. Uh, but then, yeah, get a tea going, get whiskey going, get hors d'oeuvres going, and everybody's communal around the, the 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 tarp, and they're they're dealing with the environment as opposed to trying to survive the environment. Or, or Dennis, you could be a fake bushcrafter and just cut a bunch of green things. <laughs> He's trying to open up a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I have my white tilly handy. <laughs> no, yeah, you know what. It's a, a tarp is so important. Um, I, I carry with me regularly on all my trips. Well, first off, I'm a hammock camper. So my hammock obviously requires a ham or a tarp to be over it. So if I, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not setting up a full tarp just to have around the camp, I could set up my hammock, but I could set up the tarp first and set up the hammock underneath it. So it makes it that much easier for me to be able to set up my hammock, right? I'm not getting soaked. My gear is not getting soaked under there. Uh, but it is so important to have a good quality one. These these old blue poly or green poly tarps, you know, the ones with the, with the weave. Uh, yeah, they're they're not the best. Uh, you know what? It's it's worth uh, buying, like making a good investment and buying them. They're they're all over the place. At, you know, at, at quality outdoor stores, you can also find some good quality ones on. I hate to say it, Amazon. Uh, you know, AquaQuest and and brands like that there, but. It's so important. I, I carry a ten by ten. What do you What do you usually carry, Kevin? What's your big, your colorful one? What What size is that? Oh, that's uh, that's uh, custom sewing. I love that term. Uh, yeah. For for a couple of reasons. One is it, it's um oh help me out here. It's uh oh gosh um it it's a setup. Oh gosh. Uh, what the oh what's the setup, guys? Um, <laughs> Nate. <laughs> oh, were you? I'm I'm savoring this. Keep going. Oh, oh, or is that the? Yeah, uh, I, I think I know. Someone help me here. It's basically when you put the tarp and you put the tarp down like that, and then you can move the front and the back. Uh, oh, like a circus circus tent. I no, think. no, it's a setup tarp design. Oh, Kevin outdoors, give me a hand here for the love of God. Um, a frame, oh, a frame, a frame. A -frame. Uh, I I love an a frame tarp. Um, even though. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's also a very lightweight tarp, very expensive tarp. Well, I don't know if that's that expensive, but I would not. Well, I shouldn't say not because I, I I went for years with those the entire friggin' tarps you're talking about. They weigh a ton. They fall apart. Um, uh, the wind comes, pulls the grommets all out. Yeah, piece of crap, right? But it is way it is what it is, right? But spend some money. Uh, I really have spent more money on tarps than I have on tents. And um, I got that tent, uh, or that tarp, sorry, the, the multicolored one. And my buddies, when I first brought it, they're like, what the? And I went, yeah, yeah, that's colorful. It's colorful. Well, why would you do that? I go, if a helicopter is looking for me because I need rescue, do I really need a camouflage green tarp? I yeah, right. Know. Yeah. Uh, no, I want a most colorful thing I, uh, for them to find me. And I, I, I tell you, they're going to find me with that thing. 
Yeah. Right, quick, hey, th just a little trivial question. And we'll get back on the tarps, but really, really trivial. People who buy gear, are you are you a camo or, or colors match the, the background type of color person? Or are you a colorful person that buys stuff based on being noticed? Uh, put a one in there if you're a camel person or a two if you're colorful, if you have color in your life like Kevin does. There's a big history behind that, though, Dennis. So back in the uh, late 80, 80s, early 90s, when I was in outdoor education, there was a huge like write-up, a um, whole media thing about um, you know not knowing where people can see you. So all the tents were all green or brown. Your canoes were green, brown. Uh, because it, it was, you were, you were disliked if you were colorful in the woods because you're supposed to blend into the wilderness. And I remember going through that stage and went, why? Like, I, I would like to have a really red tart to, you know, uh, I don't know. So, uh, right now I think it's a mix. Oh, you'll probably find out it's a mix. Is it? What's going yeah, on? actually it seems to be more colorful people than, uh, yeah, more, more twos in here than once. <laughs> Christine, two or whatever is on sale. <laughs> <laughs> I miss that. She's out of control. She retires in a week, you know. Oh, good for you. Congratulations. Hey. That's awesome. She's dating a person that can't ever retire, but she's retiring. Yeah. Uh, and also, there's a question about the parks reservation system. I don't know if she'll do this because she doesn't like uh, uh, being on camera or whatever, but she, if, you have, if you want someone to explain that whole system and how to go – against it and not against it, have her on. Christine, yeah. come on. You know your stuff. You're a genius with this. Come on. Yeah. The link The link is in the uh, chat if she wants it. It's right there. Like, seriously. Because we, we did the Northern uh, uh, Ontario Parks trip uh, last year, two days before we headed out. And she got us perfect sights the entire time. How she did that, I have no idea. She's a genius with that. Hmm. Awesome. You know what? I, 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 I kind of like the colorful stuff myself for the most part. Um, I, I do have a lot of greens and cac or like, you know, a dra all of drabs and stuff like that. But it, the reason being is because, well, <laughs> like Christine said, it was on sale. Right. But like, you know, th small gear, especially small gear. I really like it to be noticeable. Uh, my Mora knife, you know, it's, it's a fluorescent orange, ugly as hell. But you know what, if I drop that on, on, in the campsite somewhere, or it's sitting some. I'm going to see it. It's going to glow. Even my uh, my uh, phone case, it's got the bright orange on it, right? So things things like that, I, I like to be able to uh, see them so that uh, you do that last sweep around your campsite, you're not going to lose it or forget it, right? But yeah, anyways, so back back to uh, the shelters. Now, what what uh, what type of tents would you, would you suggest for this? Uh, should you gear towards more towards a four season ten, or just stick with a three season? That should be good enough. Oh, I like this question because um, I think I think in the last few years we've all noticed that three season tents vary greatly as far as their seasonality goes. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say the three season tent that you bought because you were going camping in the middle of July or. Um, it's probably going to have a lot more mesh in it than you may want it to for your trip in May or June. So uh, I think, you know, you're not going to necessarily run out and buy another tent with less, with less mesh or a four season tent, but you do need to be prepared for the difference um, <laughs> that <laughs> the amount of mesh in your tent uh, is going to have in the temperature that you feel inside of it, uh, regardless of the um, of the fly. And yes, Kevin's presenting a solution there to the more. No, mesh. someone's asking me what whiskey I'm drinking. Oh, I thought that was the the more mesh, the more whiskey solution to the <laughs> cooling problem inside of a three season tent. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean. <clears throat> bring your three season tent as long as you're prepared to kind of deal with the um, with the therm with the thermal value that it you know that the uh, that a tent that's ninety percent mesh will will bring it you know will bring with it. Uh, what's nice is that those tents are usually quite light, um, but they are going to uh, breathe far more kind of 
uh, efficiently than you may want them to at the end of May. Um, so that's where the, you know, the kind of packing of, uh, uh, of thermal layers, et cetera, comes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you my, my, my favorite tent when I was a tent camper, I'm more of a hammock person now, but my favorite tent when I was uh, canoe tripping for years in a tent was the Eureka El Capitan 2. Yeah. I love uh, that tent. Fantastic tent. Uh, Relating to what Nate is saying there, it had, thing has a full coverage fly that goes all the way across with, with a point that or like a cross uh, pole that goes across that gives you two very large vestibules for storage of gears, shoes, uh, whatever. Uh, the interior has has mesh. The only open exposed mesh is at the top for ventilation, uh, but the doors are full mesh. But they have the zip closure so that you can so in cooler weather you would feel no wind come through that thing whatsoever. It was, it was a beautiful, beautiful tent. I, as a matter of fact, I've still got it after probably 25 years. Uh, the, the rain fly is starting to go due to all the, the sun exposure. The tape is starting to peel off it, but uh, I got to find another tarp for it. Maybe I should contact Eureka because they still sell them after this long time. Yeah. yeah it's a really good tent. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what, what's your, what's your go-to tent, Kevin? What do you, uh, Whatever's on sale. Whatever's on sale. <laughs> uh, no, I, well, I've always used Eureka basically because, well, actually, well, he's retired now. He just retired a couple months ago. But Jim Stevens was a canoe friend of mine. Like we'd go on trips together, and he was he he was Eureka, right? Um, but I that's not that's not the reason why. But um, but the main thing is that they weren't the best tents in the world, but they were good for what oh, what Christine's as what. El Cap and oh yeah, she's a tent expert too. She has more tents than I have, which is like honest to God, that's a lot. A I think she's a better camper than you are, but well, she's a lot better about a lot of things than I am. But um, no, they uh, um, oh my, I'm all flustered now. I'm all I'm all red. Uh, what were we talking about, Dennis? <laughs> the tent thing. I don't. You got me off track too, man. I uh, no no. Uh, uh, for tents, um, yeah, your tent. For the price, uh, I I think Eureka. Canada, uh, Eureka, Canada, uh, um, you can't beat it for the quality and the price. I'm not saying that there's better tents because probably are, but for the price, um, I've never had any issues with them, especially my older ones. Like my L cap that I bought back in the early nineties, it's nothing wrong with it at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I, I'm a strong, firm believer in, in, uh, Eureka. I love my Eureka tents. I've got three of them, uh, right up to the big eight man family. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Gosh, I can't remember the name. But anyways, big eight-man tent. Uh, I got a six-person and then, of course, two-person and a bug zone, bug-free zone. Do we need a bug-free zone in the early spring? Good God, yes. Yeah? Because <laughs> well, uh, one. <laughs> it, it's a, it, what, it's almost as soon as the, the, the water starts flowing down the rivers, you'll start getting the uh, black flies hatching, right? Well, what will happen is, like, I, I always uh, love going to Gonquin just before the black flies start biting like they're out buzzing they're open, not biting. and you'll catch good brookies uh in the nipissing and the tim uh during that time uh but you know what if you say well you know the, i won't bring the bug shovel this time because they're they're not biting it they'll <laughs> that will happen yeah <laughs> you, know, you you get up in the morning in the springtime and you see the landscape ahead of you turn lime green and you're, and you're like you've got one day or two before you start dying so yeah, and they'll, they'll they'll start coming out. And when a black fly bites you, it slices your skin, pulls your skin apart, laps your blood up till till it gets you to your capillaries, and then it gets enough food protein to actually have its eggs, and then it spits in you so your blood doesn't coagulate, and that's why it issues so much. And yeah, that's called a gonquin. Yep, yep. Part 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 of the it's part and parcel with the package, right? So yes, yeah. And then mosquitoes uh, soon after. I actually I hate mosquitoes more than black flies. It's just that the buzzing drives me insane. Yeah, yeah. It's someone like always poking you. Like imagine it's, it's like we're watching a movie at the theater, which we don't do anymore. <laughs> we never will. Ever. But anyway, imagine someone poking you in the back of the head the entire time. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of people seem to be uh, into the uh, the bug free zones. I picked one up last year. Uh, they are fantastic. Um, how many people in the chat have bug-free zones? Let's see a number one in there. And how many actually use them on a regular basis? 
By the way, everybody, I brought Mark back up. He was sitting in the basement waiting here and seeing as uh, everybody is being very shy tonight and not wanting to uh, join panel to ask a question, I thought I would just bring Mark back up and uh, let you be part of the conversation, man. Thanks a lot. Cool. What are you drinking? Uh, nothing anymore. Nothing? Well, <laughs> <laughs> thick, so, you know, there's, there's a cutoff limit, you know? Yeah, yeah. So uh, when when you're uh, when you're out there canoeing yourself, there, Mark, do you always do you have a good tarp to keep yourself covered in camp? Or well, yeah, well, I'm a hammock camper, so I do have the, the tarp that goes over my hammock. Yeah. Um, and then we we also bring like. Oh, well, my sound's not working. So that's great. That's well, working. Sorry, just uh, drop out and come back in, uh, Ethan. I guess he can't hear me. Oh, yeah, I guess he can. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we're sorry. <laughs> I, I lost my train of thought, just like Kevin. Um, you. <laughs> so yeah, your your tarp. You were saying again. Sorry. Yeah. So so we're we're like all me and my friends are all hammock campers. So we all have our tarps to go with their hammocks. Mm -hmm. um, I use a Winter Dream by um, is it uh, UGQ. Mm -hmm. So I have a 13 foot winter dream that goes with my hammock. And then we usually bring this massive lightweight DD tarp. It's like 16 feet long by like 10 feet wide for like a community hammock if we need one. So, I mean, we usually get to get the camp and set up our, our tarps to go with our hammocks. So that way, if it does start to rain, then we can set our hammocks up underneath, you know, out of the rain and keep our... Yeah. Or expensive down quilts uh, out of the the wetness and whatnot. So, yeah, that that's the beauty part of the the, the whole hammock setup eh, is like having that, and even not only the setup but the tear down. Yeah, right. right. Uh, when you can actually tear down your hammock in a rainstorm and have your gear all dry underneath, and then all you're doing is you're packing your wet tarp, you bundle everything up in your dry bag. And the tarp just goes on top of that. You yeah. don't have to worry about all your gear getting wet. That's that's one beautiful benefit of uh, hammock camping for those of you that are not hammock campers. Yeah, but before I started, I had like a three-season tent that I got on sale. So Christine, yeah. and she'd be very happy about that. It was like a $350 tent, and I walked into Sport Expert, and I it had a $68 price tag on it. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to get this, no problem. So anyway, I bought a sixty-eight dollar tent, which is my my backup tent that I lend to. But the thing before I went to hammocks, you, you'd set it up, and there's so much screen going on. If it's raining, like you, you, the inside of your tent gets wet before you, you even get a chance to put the fly over the top. Yeah. Like even with the quick the quick clips and, and everything else, you know, like everything gets soaked. You gotta you know, mop it up with a towel or something, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't miss the tent days. I really don't. I, no, I still prefer my my hammock. It's uh, it's kind of nice. Back back to the uh, bug free zone. A lot of people have them. I see a lot of ones in here, and I also see a couple of other suggestions for uh, different uh, different types. The Nemo bug out and stuff like that, right? So yeah, the Nemo one is good, and also uh, Custom Sewing has one as well. Yeah, yeah. And someone mentioned also the the older uh, bug, European bug zones that they detach and. Um, I, I prefer that one in one sense because then you can just use it as a tarp when the bugs are gone in the summer. You, you just leave the mesh at home or you bring both. Uh, but the the new one, the no bug zone that's combined, it is a little lighter. I, I wouldn't say a ton's lighter, but it is lighter. So, And actually, you know, it's funny, the story behind that, uh, uh, Jim Stevens, he owes me his first child. Well, he already has children or whatever. But, but years and years ago, I ordered uh, – a bug shelter from Eureka for the campground. And it was that system with those poles. And then uh, Jim said, well, you know, we'll, we'll send it out to you. And I said, well, don't send me the poles. I don't want the poles. And he goes, well, it comes with the poles. I go, I don't want the poles because I'm going to take it in the interior. And he goes, why would you do that? I went, why would I not do that? And that's what that how that whole thing started. So uh, the next year I was showing in videos and, and then he started selling it as the bug shelter for interior camping. Mm -hmm. Well, well story. I swear to God, Nate. Nate, do you guys you guys have bug free zones in stock at uh, Ale? Um, I'm not gonna say. Not gonna say. Okay. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. I need. Um, 
I would need to check if we do it. it might be one or two spread out between a couple locations here and there. So yeah, it's gonna yeah. be it's gonna be tough to get to yeah. get them. I don't know if you guys know about it. Nate, Nate might know about it, but so Eureka Canada. Um, so Jim retired, and now Eureka Canada is now combined with Eureka US, and they're now umbrellaed over Eureka Canada, and they really don't know what's going on yet because this all happened. So. If you found if you find one, get it now. Right. I, I, I heard grumblings of that as well, and uh, so yeah, if you have the opportunity to pick one up, grab it. <laughs> yeah, anything, and don't be one of those people that pick them up and sell them on uh, eBay or on uh, Craigslist or Kijiji at like three times the price. That's that's not cool, right? That's not cool. Yeah, yeah so the, the I know. Thing, make, I'll have to make note of that. <laughs> The thing I noticed about the, the Eureka, because my, my buddy John has the first generation Eureka, which has the detachable tarp, right? Which we prefer. My friend Edgar has the second generation where the netting is attached to the tarp. The thing I find convenient about the first generation one is because you could just run your ridge line in your tarp, and then it has the adjuster straps. So if the land is uneven, you can bring that all the way down. You don't have to worry about readjusting the height of everything. With the second generation, you can just loosen the straps and bring it down and peg it out and, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got one tip for everybody, though, with the bug-free zone. Don't ever try to set it up in a windstorm by yourself. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried that on one of my solo trips last year, and I, I should have set it up when it wasn't windy, but the bugs come out and it started getting windy and stuff. I said, oh, I'm going to set this thing up and – I pulled it out of the bag. I got my ridge line up, and everything went back into the bag because the thing just took off like a parachute, right? And, and <laughs> there's a trick to it, though, too, Dennis. I, and I didn't really know that until uh, Jim was on trip with me, and then he set up the bug shelter. I was like, oh, that's – because there's two high ends and two low ends, right? Mm -hmm. So the low ends is, are where the logo is. So basically you do the ridge line high, and then the sides go low. So it's not a square. It's 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 a com completely different. So, yeah. Um, Chris, Chris Garland had a uh, a good point there. He just said, uh, hmm, "I thought it was Johnson Outdoors out of Burlington. Is that not the case anymore?" No, it's still the case, but a number of um, the operations that took place for Eureka Canada have now been moved to the U.S office that takes care of that part of the operations for eureka unfortunately yeah to, to explain a lot of to, to, the simplest form is eureka canada was jim stevens and he worked out at johnson outdoors and and he if, when you went to his office it was full of tents and full of ideas and he was he was an incredible person he invented all the stuff you see in eureka it was him at his office just him when you knew eureka us uh, and I kind of knew them when I went to shows, but they really emphasized more on campground camping, not interior. So Jim was always backcountry because that's what he was. That's what he did, right? Uh, him and I would do incredible trips. We did the Dixon Bond Show together, and he carried a can of pork and beans. Like, what the? Anyway, uh, but the, the thing, when he retired, you know, the concern is, it's like, well, what will happen to Eureka Canada? Now, I've talked to Eureka U.S., and, and they're going to still keep Eureka – Canada the way it is, um, but it's probably it's 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 during it's during the flotation device a, a time where oh my lord, we're making any sense. Nate. It's all your fault. You got me going. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, I mean, you know, aside from the, aside from the you know as good and uh, significant as the Eureka Bug Shelter is for for Ontario and for Canada, there's you know there's a ton of other alternatives out there and. Uh, I mean, if, if people figured it out for thousands of years before we came along with uh, our Eureka bug shelters stuffed into our canoe packs, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll we'll be okay for a, for a season or two. Well, I've got four of them, so I'm going to start selling them on. on where, where, where did you tell me to sell them? <laughs> Kijiji, Craigslist, yeah, Facebook, uh, Facebook Marketplace, three times the price, sure. Uh, uh, Kevin O'Doors uh, popped up a question here. I'm not sure how to decipher this here, but what are some good tips on how and what info to leave behind when you go on a trip? Well, 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 Kevin, I think when if you wrap your entire 
campsite with saran wrap. I think I you seen that comment in there. <laughs> I think you should leave that behind for someone else to use. Oh yeah. No one just. Yeah, uh, he, he put that comment earlier. He says all the rage right now seems to be uh, bringing saran wrap and wrapping it around trees to make shelters and stuff like that, right? And he says, just kidding, but. <laughs> I caused a lot of controversy this week on, on social media. Holy jumping. You know what? That That's kind of like an old school way of doing things. I know years ago, a buddy of mine, we went up, uh, we were up in Bisco Tasting and uh, we were heading up towards Indian Lake. And you're probably familiar with the area, Kevin. Uh, Indian Lake, you go up, you know where the train trestle, the train over into Indian Lake is? Yeah. Uh, train tracks, right? Yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah, and if you go further up that bay, which goes towards Ramsey Lake, yeah, he showed me what what used to be a camp back there. And we went back there, and there was freaking plastic, like, you know, the stuff that they would wrap greenhouses in, all in the bushes. And it was like, you know, the hunters and whoever maybe up in the area, whoever was up in that area, and it was all just left there, right? It's like all these shelters where, you know, they were shelters wrapped around trees using plastic wrap. Don't do that, people. Please don't do it. And if you carry in a tarp, one of those poly crap tarps, and something happens to it, please, please, please bring it out because the stuff doesn't go away, right? But, uh, yeah, that's uh, – yeah. Yeah, the, la the last time I was at that site, I know exactly the site you're talking about. Uh, someone had left one of those, you know, those plastic garages? Yeah, yeah. It, it, they they had used it, I guess. Just no, it wouldn't not a bad idea, but they left it there. So yeah, yeah. yeah nice. I yeah. Think, yeah. Oh, garbage. I think he's referring to uh, an itinerary with your uh, with your loved ones or something, so they have an idea of where you should be at what time and when you'll be back, etc. And even possibly, if the plan um, that you're leaving with someone isn't with someone that's an experienced canoe tripper you know, what to do in case that you're not back at the time you said be back, yeah. you know, eight hours later, 12 hours later, 24 hours later, uh, especially if you're not going to carry something like a two-way uh, satellite communication device, right? So, yeah, I'll be back on X day if I'm not back at this time. Yeah. No, that, that's a good idea. Thanks for piping that in there, Wilder, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was kind of wondering. That's why I said I, I didn't know how to take the question as to what he was asking there. So, It's, it's also, too, so this has happened to a lot of times uh, in the past. Uh, I make darn sure when you do get back, you tell that person you're back. Because what's yeah. happened in search and rescue is those people will be like, well, I haven't heard from them. And a, a good example is on, on the Pakistan coast, someone did a trip. Went back home, but forgot to tell the person that they're home. They did a search, and it was twenty three thousand dollars, and that person had to pay that because they're like, "Well, you should have told someone you were home. That's not our fault." Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think there also needs to be we all, we all know that there needs to be some leeway there. So if you say, "Well, I'll be back Thursday at noon, and I'll let you know when I'm back," well, you know, we might be delayed by a couple hours due to wind, right? So the last thing you want is some rescue boat out there looking for you and you're a kilometer away from the portage just chugging all, or you're, you're, you're a kilometer away from the takeout just plugging along but slowed down because of the wind. So it's something to kind of think about when you leave your itinerary and a what if plan with, you know, uh, a significant other is you want to kind of build in a little bit of padding there so uh, it's not total mayhem if you're not notifying them that you're back by an exact time on the day when you when you say you're going to be back mm -hmm. yeah my you know one of one of my things and i i've done this for years ever since i've had a cell phone and even be, be before that when i go on a trip one i always i always leave a map at home of of our route right where we're going uh and i show my wife on on the computer or whatever where we're going so that she has an idea Next thing I always do is when we get there, like after we've left and we've driven all through the night to get to Gogama or wherever the heck we're going, before I lose signal, and it's usually wherever we'll stop for breakfast before we're, we're getting ready to get or getting close to our put-in, I'll always call her. And she always expects the call from me to, you know, it could be 5 o'clock in the morning. It could be, you know, close to noon. Always let her know that we have arrived safely uh, because they're – Things can happen on the way there, let alone on the trip itself, right? Uh, when we, you know, come 
and we're we're back off the lake. First phone signal I get, I make the phone call. Tell her, yeah, we're on our way. We're on the road. Be home like you know in eight hours, nine hours, whatever it is. And I've even in some instances, if I've been out in the middle of nowhere and you happen to get those rogue signals. I'll shoot her a text. I, I, you know what? I'm not afraid of the technology part and it's not, uh, you know, trying to rely on technology, but you know what? It, 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 if it helps put my wife's mind at ease that things are going good and you know, we're, we're, we're safe. Everything's good. And my buddies have, have always picked on me about that. He's like, yeah, man, you, you know, you can't wait to, to get on the phone. It's like, no man, I'm, I'm doing my wife a courtesy. Right. So don't be ashamed to do that, people. That's what phones are for, is communication. I, I would say given um, given the uptake we're seeing in uh, GPS and, and satellite two-way communication devices for you know going into this season, don't wait until the day of your trip to test it out for the first time. Uh -uh. For the love of God, like I, you know, I, I, I I see more and more people buying them and it, you know, that's great and everything. Um, but if you're going to test out to see if your subscription went through on your credit card to see if the, you know, to see if you can text home through your iPhone via the Bluetooth setup on your, you know, Garmin mini inReach, the day of your trip is not the time to do it. Um, so please, for the love of God, whatever you're going to buy for this coming season, make sure everything works flawlessly before you jam it in your pack or or in the pocket of your pfp to actually go forth with it so yeah um there, there was a, a, a name uh years ago i was going to the far north for a trip and i was going with some government biologists and the one guy beside me in the float plane he was he was reading the instructions of the sat phone <laughs> while we're flying in i know like that's not a good uh, <laughs> <laughs> i remember when i bought my my spot uh Gen three there. I was driving around town. I had the thing on the dash, man. I was I was setting my tracks to see. I was I was practicing with it, right? I wanted to see how it worked before I uh, I got out there. And you know what? They also have uh, all, all these systems. Always have. Um, you have to go onto the computer, log into their systems. It's like the back end part, right? And you can actually do a test SOS beacon on it. Right. So that like you go in there and you shut like you, you set it to test and you could actually do your test to make sure it is working because your SOS signal is no good to you if, it, if it's not working. Right. So be sure to test that out as well. Yep. Um, yeah. trip, tripping and twacking, uh, uh, twipping and twacking, tripping and tracking <laughs> had a had a good question. Uh, they said uh, 5G and other technical advances uh, will uh, eventually bring signal and service everywhere. Well, we'll see about that. Uh, how do you think that will affect backcountry camping? And I would say, um, as far as safety goes, uh, it would, you know, hopefully affect it in a positive way. As far as, as far as the experience of backcountry camping goes, that will be completely up to the user and the educational aspect of why the user is out there in the first place. Um, so, you know, for me, um, I wouldn't really care if I had 5G service or not, and I wouldn't care if the person in the campsite across the lake from me has 5G service or not, as long as they're not using that 5G service to stream Spotify to a very loud sound device that is piping, um, you know, Canada's next hip hop hits across the lake to me uh, mm -hmm. every morning. So um, I think as far as safety goes, it can be a positive thing. Um, how it's managed is going to be up to uh, individuals and and the reason why those individuals are out there in the first place. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had a, um, some older, <laughs> older gentlemen uh, confront me about me bringing a, like a spot Gen 3 and, and a sat phone. You know, back in the day, we never needed that. I went, no, you didn't have that back in the day. And I wish we right. did have it back in the day when I took you, you youth out. But there's a fine line too, where you know when you have it. Like I'll take uh, college students out, and they're like, "Geez, Kevin, you remember when the Blue Jays were playing?" And it was like the last, and we're out on the seven day trip uh, in the fall, and they're like, "Kevin, for the love of God, let, can we just use the phone one, one call, one call to see if they're winning, one?" And so I said, "Okay, but it's only for emergency services, but just just one call, and you got two minutes, and choose who you're calling." 
So they called the one guy's mom, and the mom wasn't watching the game, and that was it. And they're like, oh, for the love of <laughs> But uh, it, it does give that false sense of security too. What I generally do is I have that equipment on on my in my pack, the plot device and sat phone. I tell someone else in the group where it is if something happens to me, but nobody else knows where it is. Because generally someone will say, well, I want to call my wife tonight. Well, do you do you need to call your wife tonight? Because um, I've, I've been on trips where someone has called their wife every night and had an argument with that person every night. And then someone got sick uh, on the trip and we had to call a float plane in. We had a quarter battery left, right? So it's that fine line. And it, it I, I don't uh, I don't think that we should not have that to those devices, but we also have to have ethics behind it. Uh, yeah. There was a, the, the superintendent of Quetico was furious with the one day I was there. He, and I said, what happened? He goes, well, we went out to rescue someone, but we got another call in to rescue someone else and they were closer, so we went and got them. And it was their dog that had diarrhea. They called in a helicopter to get this dog because it had diarrhea. The other guy was almost dead. So they, got, they finally got to that person, but it's, but so they were infuriated by having this device and then, you know, people can just say, Hey, look, my dog got diarrhea. I can call someone right now. Or what if you did need help? Like, like you were saying, Dennis, like there's nothing wrong with you using technology. You just have to have fix behind it. Right. Well, hey, I'll, I'll be a hundred percent honest. I, I've actually three years ago up on Mendelssohn Lake up near Gogama, uh, Thai cats were in the playoffs. <laughs> I had signal. It was a crappy night. My buddy and I sat under the tarp and we listened to the Thai cats football game. Right? <laughs> it's like what the hell? Right? What else are you gonna do? <laughs> You're the devil, Dennis. You're the devil. I know, I know, rebel. Right? Yeah. I, I'll oh. throw I'll throw another kink into the equation there as far as uh, how helpful cell phone service everywhere can be. Um in that with the kind of the the slightly newer backcountry user that we're seeing um it's all fine and dandy to be able to call in some help from your campsite uh but it only really works if you can tell that someone you're calling exactly where you are yeah now uh, they they could definitely uh be be i i i'm technology's our friend i i think it is as long as you use it within its means but one thing, one thing, and, and somebody, I think it was, uh, who was it there, had asked, what about, like, you know, if these things crap out and his wife's going to be all worried, make sure you carry extra batteries for these things. Uh, some brands have been known to, like, just eat batteries. And, uh, you know, make sure you always got your, your batteries. Uh, you got you, you have to make sure. So start with fully charged ones. Buy, buy a brand new pack or, or the fully recharged rechargeables. And... Make sure you carry spares. Uh, also, uh, and I, I should never tell this story because it's just so wrong, but um, I, I've asked a lot of bush pilots in the north, what should I do if I get lost or, or get in trouble? Should I signal you with my, my mirror on my compass? Should I do that? And they're like, no, we'll never see that unless we know where we're looking. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't know where you are, then it's like a needle in a haystack. And the, the one guy repeatedly always said, he goes, Kevin, if, it, if everything else fails, Powell to an island, ignite it on fire, and we'll go. We'll come looking. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little extreme. Well, you think about it. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the know, biggest smoke it, signal you can make, right? Yeah, I should never have told anybody that. I yeah. would say if we're if we're leaving final thoughts, um, the biggest thing I've noticed from people coming from. Um, south of here to go into the park is that they've packed for the climate that they're currently experiencing where they are and so i would say um if anything please for the love of god pack warmer than you think you're going to need based on uh the the you know the town that you're sitting in your house uh packing your bag in right now uh, because time and time again, we get people rushing in last second buying um, mitts and gloves and toques and base layers because they had no idea how cold it was going to be until they actually got here and, and got out to put their canoe on their roof. And, oh, my goodness, it's freezing. Um, so so if there's anything you can, I, I know it's a bit of preaching to the choir here tonight, but if there's anything you can pass on to 
uh, to people that are planning, uh, you know, new to planning spring trips is uh, plan to be, plan to stay warm, plan to be warm, um, and plan to pack that way, even though it may be 17 degrees and sunny where you're packing. It's not going to be that way when you get here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know what, guys? We are uh, at 9.22, so we're like uh, 20 minutes past our – 20 minutes into overtime, as I, I like to say it. Uh, I think um, we'll go to 9.30, but I'm just going to put it out there. If anybody has any final questions that they would like answered, uh, drop it in now. I'll take three more questions that uh, we can try and uh, cover here for uh, the spring – backcountry camping or, or canoeing or hiking and we'll do our best to get through that if not we'll get a, a few closing statements of advice from kevin nate and uh, mark and uh then we'll move on to uh preparing for next week's show so if anybody has any final questions look, look what dennis made me yeah I, I pulled the crayons out on that one i know i'm on my speaking tour right now so i this is not to do with now i shouldn't have that up with everybody no, I, oh I, you know what by all means that's what the show is all about man exposure and oh, these, oh, these oh. Are, uh, a whole list of kevin's sponsors up there so uh be sure to support kevin's uh sponsors because by supporting kevin's sponsors uh it helps support kevin right well the truth is i duct taped it and it stuck to and i, I it'll peel the paint off i take it off but no, this this whole next couple of months, I'm doing presentations online instead of going to shows. Like I missed the Toronto show, like Michigan, a quiet, uh, quiet adventure, Cunucopia, the Midwest show, all these shows. Uh, I mean, the good thing is I'm not traveling everywhere, um, but I'm stuck here. So uh, Dennis said, "Well, you know, what do you need?" I went, "Well, my sponsors they 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 pay for you know, me to do these presentations, not this one, but the others." So he made that. Look at it. this is what he does for a living. This is what Dennis does for a living. Yeah, 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 I do. That's what I do for a living. <laughs> Jonathan Mullet, thanks for this comment, man. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> That's awesome. I'm so glad I'm teaching. So we know Jonathan took something out of the show. <laughs> Well, I don't see any more questions coming in. Uh, that's awesome. Kevin, do you have any uh, last tidbits of, of advice for anybody that uh, might be setting up for their first winter or spring uh, spring trip? Yeah, get everybody together now with masks or by Zoom and do a, what I call a map and flap. So you get together and you look at the maps and you get the gear and you make a, a plan. And it's so much fun. Sometimes planning the trip is actually a lot more fun than the trip itself. Uh, but, but make a plan. But also... The very important thing, go to every single person in the group and say, what do you want out of this trip? And make sure that that trip answers everybody's uh, um, comment because that's what is a good trip. Uh, you know, it makes sure if they don't want to do rapids or they want to catch trout or they want to just have fun or they want to go huge distances in, in quick time. But make sure that you communicate about that first before the trip or because 90% of the trip is all to do with human conflict and human communication and getting along with everybody on the trip. You might see a loon, you might see a moose, and that's fantastic. But if you don't like your canoe partner, it's going to be hell. Absolutely hell. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. How about yourself, Nate? Um, I would say this. It's something I've, I've thought about lately. Um, give yourself some time to actually not – you know, always have to push for the portage or the site um, to make a loop. So I would just say, especially in the spring when, when you're going to have to possibly overcome some hurdles that you wouldn't in July or August, um, give yourself some more time. Uh, don't be in a rush. Um, it's safer that way. It's more enjoyable that way. Um, and uh, I think you're going to have a better time if you're not always kind of like uh in a rush to have to, to have to get somewhere. So I would say if you can spread it out over three days instead of two, um, then do it. You can spread it out over, over six days instead of five, then do it. it your trip will only be the better for it if you can uh, take some more time um, to make it happen. Especially in the spring because you can run into those bad weather days and yep. you don't want to be paddling when it's pouring rain, right? Awesome. Thanks. Mark, what about yourself? you have any final uh, statement that you'd like to add there? Um, I'd just like to say for any newcomers getting out to parks or whatever, just try and learn the do's and don'ts of what you're supposed to do and the rules of the park. Um, and for, you know, people that have 
have been doing this for years, like trying to have a little bit of patience for people that are coming to the park for the new times. Because the first times I got out, I looked around with my friend and I said, you know what the sad thing is, is like, we're probably going to be the last generation to do stuff like this. And despite the whole COVID thing that got people into the park that maybe should have been doing what they were doing or not doing what they were doing, it got people out there. And I think that that over time will let them learn and actually enjoy what we've all been doing for years. So I think that's a really good point that especially what's going on this week with a lot of uh, debate on my, my social media that I put up and, and, and it comes down to a lot of people my age are saying, you should do this. You should do that. You, you don't do this properly. You, you know, this is my view. Like, just let them be like, like they forget that they, 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 weren't like that back. You know, I mean, I'm, the amount of trips I did, I had no, and I still do. I don't have a freaking clue at times, right? And I think it's really important that let them do the trip, let them learn from it. If they don't learn from it, then that's a problem. Yeah. But um, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. I, I wrote a piece that will be out in Explore Magazine on Monday that I think everybody will really like. Uh, I actually just threw it right at everybody, saying, okay, this social media stuff, it's got to stop. What? Who cares what gear you have? Who, what, who cares what you have as long as you're going out there safe and having fun and actually enjoy the wilderness or whatever you want to term wilderness. I still think wilderness is a, is a term for it, but it, it's just out of control right now with social media. Um, and we just got to chill and relax, or I'm just going to do a lot more solo trips and just become a hermit. Yeah. Well, like I said, I think it's just a question of, I think that newcomers need to take the time to learn what they're supposed to do and not supposed to do no you know what i'm saying like you know the first time we went out i actually took the time to read that big long list of rules that was for algonquin park because i didn't i didn't want to disrespect anything i didn't want to do something that wasn't right you know and i think the people that kind of got pushed into the outdoors this year didn't take the time to do that and i think they should and like i said us being like you know like more or less veterans like i'm not a veteran by all means but like i'm saying is we have to kind of be patient with the people that are trying to learn because it is getting people out to the places that we love and get you know letting them experience what we what we experience you know yeah, yeah. The, one of the greatest things like what i so if you go back to those videos i did with fall uh backpacking with students and you watch those videos and a lot of people say how do you ever survive with those kids like they didn't know anything I went, yeah, like they didn't know then, but patience, seven days in the bush and watch their smiles at the end. Watch it the last hour of that trip and how they never wanted to go home. None of them wanted to go home. And if you were, were so arrogant to say, well, you're wrong, I'm right, you're an idiot, um, that's just wrong. It's just completely wrong. Uh, and just patience, right? Yeah. Oh, I have one final closing statement. I know I did promise everybody to a, uh, a shot of the gear list, so I'll do that just before the show closes out uh, so you can grab a screenshot or you can actually email me for a PDF copy of it there. I'll put the link up on the uh, the screen here in a second. Uh, my, my thoughts on spring camping trip. It is a beautiful time of year to actually get out there and paddle or hike. Uh, you're getting to see the transition from, uh, you know, no tree or uh, no leaves up to, you know, buds coming out on the trees. You might see uh, a lot more animal encounters because it's cool, including bears. got to be careful there. Uh, but you know what? Ultimately, spring camping, beautiful time. You need to be careful. You need to be safe. Weather conditions can warrant uh, hypothermia. Uh, you know, it can get cold. It can get rainy. It can get warm. It can get snowy. There's so many different things that are going to be thrown at you. Ultimately, you got to stay dry. You have to stay safe. Best way to uh, to plan for these things is talk to people who know who have done it before or possibly trip with somebody who's done it before so that they can advise you along the way. Don't skimp on gear if possible. I know Kevin just said that, like, you know, you, you use what you got. Yes, use what you got, but learn how to use it properly so it's gonna you're going to get the max out of it. Uh, you know what? Be safe out there. Get out there and enjoy the outdoors, man. Uh, spring, summer, winter, and fall. We have four seasons that are fantastic. They all offer their own benefits, and we can all reap the benefits if we learn how to enjoy it out there. So, 
Yeah, with that being said, uh, I'm just going to pop up here really quick. Anybody wants a screenshot of my gear packing list? Uh, this is a screenshot of it. Feel free to, uh, to grab that. Uh, all items on here are things that I use personally on trips. Uh, I will alter it based on the trip that I'm doing, whether it's a spring, summer, winter, or fall trip. Uh, you know, you, you can alter it however you like. But if you would also like a copy of this, a hard copy, or not a hard copy, but a, uh, a PDF copy, you could send me an email to canoehound at gmail.com, and I would be more than happy to fire you off a PDF of my uh my personal list and uh you can actually uh alter that and print it however you like as well so hopefully everybody's got that uh let's see and i'm gonna drop the gear list now hopefully you got that if not you can go back and you could uh, do a screen capture on that good god how big is your pack <laughs> hey, i got an old ostrom pack <laughs> Got the big Ostrom pack, man. I could fit a lot of crap in that thing. <laughs> Kevin, don't don't be mad at Dennis because he takes something to brush his teeth with. Uh, I'm sorry, man. I can't do the charcoal thing. <laughs> but no, anyways, this is the uh, this is a a copy of the uh, the list that I can send you by PDF. Just drop me an email at canoehound at gmail.com, and uh, you can do whatever you want with that uh, list. You can use it. You can burn it. Use it for toilet paper. I don't care. You're using your own printing paper. That's all right. Anyways, uh, I'm just going to drop you three fellows into the uh, the green room. I'll be down there in a minute with you. And, uh, yeah, well, I'm just going to close up this show. All righty. All right, everybody. I uh, just want to thank everybody for joining tonight. Uh, anybody that may be new or uh, may be watching this uh, after the fact, we are live every Tuesday evening here on uh, Canoe Hound Adventures on the Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventures show. Uh, we got a lot of great things coming up here in the future. Just to uh, re-mention again for next week's show, we have a special guest on. Will be uh, CW Goats Gets. Sorry, CW Gets from the uh, radio podcast and uh, video program called The Camping Show. And we'll be talking a lot about the camping show. So you can uh, find another great resource for uh, backcountry camping. He covers everything from hiking, biking, packing, uh, backcountry camping, uh, car camping, everything. It's the camping show. So you'll want to make sure you tune in for that uh, next Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please hit that subscribe button. If you like what you've seen tonight, uh, we have a lot of great shows like this. And the only way you're going to get to see it is if you're subscribed to the channel. Or you can also follow it on Facebook under Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show on Facebook. That's our, our Facebook page. Get on there and like that. That's where we put all our uh, weekly updates as to what's coming up with the show, show ideas, casting calls, things of that sort. So you'll want to make sure uh, you keep up to date with that there. Once again, if you're interested in patches or anything like that, feel free to drop me an email. Canoehound at gmail.com is the email that you're going to be pretty much using all the time except for the contest. And uh, let's see here. I think that is about it. Anyways, I'd like to thank everybody, especially my panel members tonight. Uh, they all did a great job of sharing information for this uh, spring camping season that's going to be coming upon us. And in the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and remember, people, keep the adventures alive.